Hi, Daniel. Thanks so much for joining me, friend. Happy to be here. As I've told you, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, longer than I've been able to record this, uh, that pilgrim life, though. And um, I, I, yeah, I liked uh, recently I've been really trying to sit with what it is that I'm curious about someone and why I want to have the conversation, why I feel called to. And of course, on the outside, I am very interested in the Maximum New York project that I'm sure we'll talk quite a bit about and how you got there. Um, also interested in someone's life story that gets them to the point where they're like, this seems like a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. There's so much in our stories and our lives that um, fuels a project like that. And I think that adds a lot of context. So I'll be excited to hear what you say. Um, I think your bio really said it the most that um, currently on Twitter, it says that you're something about um, out competing the anti-politics meme. And yes. I was like, oh, I, I have that bug. So let's see what we can do about that. And like, uh, maybe we'll butt heads about it or something, mm -hmm. but like I, I, I'm open to being politics, anti-politics meme, unfucked, unbrainwashed uh, politics memed. I don't know. I'm open to it. So maybe that'll happen in this conversation. Um, and uh, I think that'd be exciting if you could manage to persuade me <laughs> otherwise of my dispositions. Uh, yeah. And also just your your vibes are very sweet and lovely. And I suspect we'll have a great conversation. So with all that context in play, um, I would love to turn it over to you and hear about your life story in whatever way you'd like to share. Could be long, could be short, could be uh, factual, it could be poetic, it could be an interpretive dance if you wanted. Any way that mm -hmm. you feel like you want to answer that is fair game, and uh, I'd just love to hear from you about your life so far. Well, the poetic introduction is that I'm a Midwesterner by birth, a New Yorker by choice, and an American by God. And mm. the the factual statement of that is that I grew up on a farm in Indiana. And generally, I I think this is true of many people, but I think of my life in a series of alloys, or I would use the word dichotomy, but dichotomy makes you think that the things are split and an alloy is things that have been blended together, usually for good effect. So um, and I think that's a very American thing as well, in the best sense of it. So I grew up on a farm that really, as an adult, that is clearly not the life for me because I have found myself in New York City, very happily so, and I want to spend the rest of my days here. Um, but I love all of America. I love the place that I grew up. People just have different preferences and the way that they ultimately like to live. And one of the things I like best about this country is that it's so large and there are so many different ways, so many different places that everyone can probably find a place that fits them more or less. So, uh, like I said, I don't think I was particularly built for the farm or the rural life. Nothing against it, but not for me. And I was generally more academically inclined all throughout school, uh, musically inclined, did marching band, played piano, ran cross country. I think this profile would be relatively familiar to a lot of people. And I eventually, at the, towards the end of high school, started to think about where else in the world might I want to go, which is, that happens to a lot of people when college application time comes around. And I had previously traveled around the United States for a variety of different competitions. The first time I came to New York actually was because of a national parliamentary procedures competition when I was 15. And I did from that point, I had a magical experience. I did from that point know I probably wanted to wind up in New York, but I was waylaid in Cambridge and Boston because I applied and uh, through a mix of, mix of hard work, but also luck of the draw was accepted into Harvard College. So I studied government as an undergrad, and we might get into more detail there because I've uh, kept my interest in government for a very long time. I've been interested in it since I was little. Everyone has that system in their brain that just really hits it just the right way. For some people, it's coding, which I enjoy, but am an amateur with. Um, for other people, it's music, which I also enjoy, but am an intermediate amateur with. But government and the law hits me just right. So I've always been interested in it, um, studied it as an undergrad, and for a variety of reasons, did not have a smooth or straightforward undergraduacy at Harvard. Um, 
not only was my background different, but my expectations for the government department and what I should get out of my degree were different. An illustrative example is great inflation, which hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, so uh, my one of my close or new friends that I made at college, both of us wound up taking one of the same introductory government classes. And I worked very hard on our first paper. And I, I think it was a good paper. Um, multiple drafts, well argued, had asked other people to edit it. I think I did a good job. Uh, and as as an example of that, our TA wound up circulating the paper as an example. You know, this is what it should look like. This is what freshmen should aspire to write about. Well, then we both got our papers back. I got an A and his paper had looked, you know, it was bled on by red ink. So it looked like someone had been murdered on it and he got an A minus. So um, I found that that was the norm and I was not used to such a differential or lack of differential between work and the grade that you would receive. And all things said, this is actually not, this is this is a me problem at the end of the day. It's not an anyone else problem. Um, but I, I did have a lot of trouble adjusting to that. It felt extremely unfair. It felt like my efforts were being watered down or not recognized as a result of that. And it, it caused me to burn out um, very quickly. So I took my sophomore spring semester off and did a variety of things. Wound up, I moved to Bloomington, Indiana, where I, Indiana University is, and several of my friends attended. So I just I thought I was going to spend the semester there and just reset before returning to college. Uh, but I got pretty bored after six weeks, so I be, I went to Heidelberg, Germany, and worked as an au pair for a couple of months. I came back to the United States that summer, and then uh, wound up working as a bilingual English Spanish customer service agent for Puma north of Cincinnati, Ohio. And then at the conclusion of that, I came back for my junior fall semester. And I was it, I was much refreshed. Like I said, the problems with great inflation, the frustration that I felt, mostly a me problem. Um, and that had been resolved. Uh, in my soul, I felt much more comfortable. Um, or comfortable might not be the right word. I was simply no longer bothered by it. I just thought I'll apply my own efforts and learn what I'm here to learn. And it really doesn't matter for the most part what other people are doing. That doesn't really affect what I'm doing. So I had a much better second half of college and then eventually graduated, went really well, thought I wanted to go to law school, ultimately got a job as a corporate paralegal at a large law firm in Boston. And as it turns out, that work, I, I again, a, an illusion was shattered because I realized most of these people don't like their jobs. And if you get them behind a closed door, they will tell you probably don't go to law school. They will even tell you that they regret it. Um, but at the same time, they're not going to leave their job. And you can witness people, that psychological trap that people get into. And for either a feeling of helplessness or a lack of courage, they cannot bring themselves to leave that situation. So I quit that job after 11 months with no plan, moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. I worked in a coffee shop and I finished my third book. Um, by, by that point, I'd written two science fiction novels. And the this third one was just called Dear Wayne County. It was a short memoir. I grew up in Wayne County, Indiana. And that was eight months very well spent because again, like my semester off in college, it was a vital point of recalibration. And also I was grievously poor both times. Um, as you, a pattern that recurs as I make life decisions that I do not regret and that I would do again in a heartbeat that keep me from making money or they very quickly destroy all the savings that I have. But again, worth it um, for the spiritual cultivation and for finding the life direction. So after living in Cincinnati for eight months, I also wanted to see how I liked the, the Midwest as an adult. And again, wonderful, not quite for me. Moved back to Boston, worked a variety of jobs, wound up back at the same law firm on their PR team and was happily received back. And I took that job because it was the means of getting to New York City because that law firm had a New York City office. And so it's pretty easy to just squeak down. And, and so I, wound, I moved to New York City February 1st, 2019. So I'm coming up on the five-year anniversary in just about two weeks. And haven't looked back. If it, It's fit like a glove since day one. 
And uh, of course, a lot has happened for all of us since 2019, but I have been here all five years. I have regretted none of them. I have generally had a wonderful time throughout the duration. And maybe we can talk about some of the more recent things um, at length. But since moving here, I left my job at the law firm with about a, net worth, a positive net worth, a liquid positive net worth of $20,000 in July of 2020. And have done a variety of odd jobs since then until I started to teach with uh, my new civic school, Maximum New York, in late March of 2022. And that has been the focus of my endeavors since that time. So we're not even at the two-year mark of that yet. But And of course, you know, the, the cherry on top of the life story is my most recent bout with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a blood cancer. But, you know, we can also talk about that. That's, you know, that's the beanie-inducing incident. Um, you would see the eyebrows really, this beanie is great because my eyebrows stop right about, they get really thin right about here. So uh, it'll grow, start to grow back relatively soon, but that's brings us up to the present. Mm -hmm. mm. It's such a treat to hear this, all of it. Uh, this is a hard question for a lot of people. And I don't know if it was hard for you, but um it's a real privilege to hear what someone has to say about this and yeah, really how they understand their life and how they understand themselves. And uh, it shows so much about someone, things that are obvious and things that are subtle. And I just feel grateful to have received this and so curious about many things. So I'll dive into my questions, but thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for doing one human, the greatest kindness that you can do another, which is to ask them to speak at length about a thing they're interested in, which uh, for me includes my own life. Oh, well, that's one of my favorite things is to ask a question and have someone answer fully. So feel free to speak at great length about anything I ask you about. Uh, let's see where to start. Um, you said, I'm sure this personality to, to paraphrase that this sort of personality or disposition is familiar to a lot of people where you're like doing a lot of extracurriculars and that sort of thing. How, how would you describe that? How would you characterize yourself at that time or in general? Like how would you characterize your personality or your disposition? Um, are you asking about a specific time or? Um, this sort of came about because I think you were describing in high school, you're like, oh, I did this uh, and I did yeah. that and I did that. And you're like, everybody knows about that. I'm like, I do. And also, well, I wasn't that type of person. Um, yeah. in a certain way. I mean, I, maybe you could describe me that way. I don't know. I'm confused about that, but, um, focus on you. What, what, um, yeah. How do you understand your own personality or disposition? Well, at that time, it was certainly a blend of multiple things as I think, I think that descriptor is just generally applicable to someone when they're when they're an adolescent, because they're, they're still becoming, I mean, we mm. all, we're all continually becoming as we go throughout our lives, but adolescence is a very potent form of it, no matter what you do. So I did a lot, <clears throat> um, what well, track cross country, but also marching band concert. Yeah. I was so deep into music, marching band, concert band, jazz band, winter percussion, um, very involved with athletics, as I said, as well, various academic teams, Future Farmers of America, which is FFA, BPA, Business Professionals of America. I mean, the list, the list goes on. Um, <laughs> and the reason why, well, and starting my sophomore summer, I gradually transitioned to um, college classes as well. So by my senior year, I was um, about, a, I was a full-time college student and was just taking one class uh, one high school class in the morning and I would get in my car and drive to the other end of the county and take take the class take classes at Ivy Tech, Indiana University East and Earlham College and then come back by 3 p.m. for cross country practice or something. Mm. Um, so I like I said, why why was I like this or what was going on? Um, I think two things are broadly true, probably more. One of them was simply, if you're a curious person, you're relative, you know, I'd only been on earth for 17 years or so, and there's just so much. So part of it was just someone being presented with an embarrassment of riches. And isn't it also wonderful? Can't I just do it all? 
Hmm. And so you apply your energy as best to try to experience all the wonderful things that you are in front of you. That was definitely part of it. The other part was I saw it as purely instrumental as a means to achieve, get to the top, get to the college as I want, um, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually I, eventually I properly contextualized that feeling, which is achievement really is good. It's wonderful. It's what's built all of civilization, but achievement against which standard and for whom that I was not quite correct on when I was in high school. So achievement against which standard, largely that's grades. Again, you can, so you can see, this is one of the reasons why I had trouble with grade inflation at college. So grades are fake, generally speaking, I think, um, at this point, but I didn't know that at the time, or at least I didn't fully know it at the time. So against which standard that, um, for whom, it was for me, but as I think is common with many adolescents, also many adults, you want to impress other people or you want to live up to their expectations. And that was also going on. And like I said, it was there was a lot of exogenous motivation. I wanted to do things for the sake of others, for the sake of standards that I didn't adopt for myself. There was a lot of that, but I do think the bulk of it was the good version, which is, or the version I prefer, which is um, standards that emanated from myself, things that I enjoyed, things I genuinely wanted to pursue. But yeah, I, these things are inseparable. At least they certainly were for high school, Daniel. Hmm. Wow. Uh, you answered like three of my nested follow-up questions with the first one. I love this. Um, so I'll go to number four. Yeah, secret number four. <laughs> which is... Um, what, well, so to reflect what I'm hearing, like at the time you were motivated by, on the one hand, curiosity about the world. There's a lot of things you were very curious. And on the other hand, like achievement and specifically other focused achievement, like recognition status, like with your peer group or, you know, infrastructure at the time, like school or whatever. And mm -hmm. it sounds to me like the way you're talking about it, that you have the same values now, but like seen from a different perspective where it's more internal, you still value achievement, ambition, accomplishment, but your standards of what that is. And obviously you're still curious, <laughs> uh, but your <clears throat> motivation, <clears throat> excuse me, is more internal. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could describe your relationship to ambition or achievement now, like what you're doing is incredibly ambitious. It's one of the most ambitious projects I know of in my peer group um, in, in a certain category, like mm -hmm. um, doing something out of the box, like you're a live player in Samoburia's thing, like you're doing something novel. And I love that. Like, I haven't been interested in the games that other people are playing. I'm like, oh, that's boring. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm like, you're playing a game that I like and you're doing something cool. So how would you describe your current relationship to those values um, now? Yeah. Uh, well, you broadly hit it, which is instead of exogenous standards and values or, you know, in part anyway, it's almost, it's largely almost entirely endogenous um, coming. Well, I mean, I would say the, the, reason for that shift and it took years i think it will take most people years as they grow out of adolescence and into adulthood if they do it at all is you realize that external standards will hold you back from achieving the thing that you actually want quite often so this this happened in many ways for me i think it happens in many ways for a lot of people i mentioned when i worked as a corporate paralegal i had a lot of lawyers who were wonderful smart kind people they treated me well and I, in fact, have nothing bad to say about my time at the firm um, and how people treated me there. But also, I saw how all of the lawyers had these, this is an example of them having external standards. Um, what is status and prestige? What happens if they leave this job that pays really well, that is legible to society, you know, high-powered, high-priced corporate lawyer, to pursue whatever it is that they're interested in, whatever that, that might be. In the first instance, that's going to confuse a lot of the, the peers that they have chosen for themselves. And probably it will cause a status drop. Probably they'll be pushed out or they'll move 
uh, you know, further away from the core of their current status hierarchy, and that will feel bad, and they're afraid of that. But that's all a result of having external standards of, as your own. If you really do care about those external things in your soul, they're going to block you from doing the things that you would like to do, the things that internally are pulling on you. So for me, it's, it's a broad story of recognizing that fact and recognizing that, I mean, people have different stories about whether you should follow the light in your heart or be of the world, that sort of thing. And usually there's, they have a pragmatic reason why you should be of the world. And I just think, well, I don't, I don't deny that you have to live on earth and that you have to be pragmatic according to the dictates of reality, but we are human. So reality is not a given we must accept. We can create it. We can change it. You can do this on an individual level. You don't have to think, I will create a space program. I will create a new metal. I will revolutionize physics or whatever. I will write the great American novel. You can just think I will live life on my own terms and I will do that which is required to accomplish that. That's a version of bending reality. Uh, because saying that you want to live on your own terms and then actually doing it is quite something. So anyway, to answer your question, um, you could give many concrete examples of this, but the broad arc is the recognition that external standards that you have not chosen and that don't live in your soul will hold you back from achieving the things that you want. And maybe the things that you do want are extraordinary. And a lot of people in their hearts really do have extraordinary dreams. They think, I would like to be a wonderful musician and I'd like to play on stage to adoring crowds. Or I would like to be a wonderful artist. I would like to be a wonderful writer. Maybe I could go back and study computer science and I could code. I did it that one time and it seemed great, but then work picked up. You know, people have these wonderful visions all the time in their head and then they let them go for one reason or another, but you don't have to. That doesn't mean it's easy to achieve them, but okay, do the hard, do, do the hard thing then. Suffer a little bit, but it is worth the payoff. Okay, several questions about this. First off, you mentioned soul and internal mm -hmm. standards and, uh, you know, light versus the world. Like, um, I imagine you're speaking poetically about a soul, but like, what, what do you mean? And uh, how do you hold what it is to be a human in this world? I am I am speaking poetically, yes. Um, what do I hold? What do I, you know, what do I mean by being human in this world or how do I regard it? <laughs> um, we are conscious beings. That by itself is already quite the departure from average as far as we can tell, as far as mm. we can observe in the universe. So it's rare and that makes it special. And, or or at least interesting, it's a deviation. Um, but in general, when I look at humanity and uh, when I look at the sweep of history, I think how wonderful these creatures are, how wonderful all of us are and all of our potential. I think I have a general benevolence for humanity, at least for what it could be, even if it isn't that thing at the moment. Um, I, the powers of creation that every individual has, not to speak of the powers of creation that we have as a species, which are clearly very potent um it is magic i mean often i mean you could use many different fields for the comparison i'm about to make i'll use computer science uh often people talk about just for fun they'll talk about well what if we lived in a world with witches and wizards sometimes they use harry potter as the example but wouldn't it be cool if i had a wand and i could cast spells and make things happen in reality and they yes um and I think there's a reason why they all think this because it's it's a potent vision. It's wonderful. It's fun, uh, and they think if I lived in that world, I would I would really lean into cultivating my magic. I would become a I would really try to become a powerful witch or wizard. And I've had I've had quite a lot of these conversations, and they go exactly the same way. Which is, I say, well, you you could do that now. There are many ways that you can exercise scaled impact on human civilization by saying the right words. I mean. You could, I mean, that's either in the form of coding, you can code something, and then that that will change potentially computer infrastructure um, in a very large domain. But also you can just write essays. It really comes back to magic words. Um, I, 
anyone who has written online for any extended fashion has probably seen a version of this. If you write the right words, all of a sudden, new friends will appear, resources will appear, things in the world will move. And the longer you write those magic words and the better you get at crafting them, the more things move, the more people come around, etc. So why do I think humans are? What do I think about humans? What do I think about the soul? Um, fundamentally, humans exercise potent powers of creation if they would like, guided by their own mind. And to me, that's the essence of humanity. And it's wonderful. So beautiful. So beautiful. Um, what are the values that are motivating your ambition and action in the world for yourself and your own soul at this time? Well, the values are the world can always be better. And generally speaking, I'm quoting one of my personal heroes. Her name is Elizabeth Barlow Rogers, and she's the woman who saved Central Park. There's a story there. Um, <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing, but she said, don't try to save the world. Just take the first step and then mm. the next and then the next. I fundamentally buy into this, um, which is to say, I do want what I do to have positive effects that redound as far as possible, including the whole world, if that's how it could go. But saving the world is a is too much for one person to take on, no matter how potent they are. You always need other people in a variety of respects. And just personally, you can only do so much in a day with your own mind, your own hands, etc. And things compound. So I think often people especially, well, in certain domains, in various domains, uh, young people burn out because they, they take as their personal responsibility and mission saving the world. Well, how do you, how do you even approach that problem? What does that even mean? I think it's very hard to say what the answer to that is on both counts. But if you say today, I will, this is speaking for myself today, I will write an essay about the anti-politics meme. And that might change the way some people view the world. It might make them update in a more optimistic direction. And that, in turn, might unblock positive action. Maybe they thought it wasn't worth it before, but they think it's worth it now. So all any of us can do is just take one step and then the next. Um, and I'll have to ask you to repeat the question now, because I think I've gone for a far, pretty far afield, but. Yeah, what, what do you value in yourself? <clears throat> yeah, I will take the next step. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, you could, I could make a list of virtues. There's things like honesty, integrity, productivity, prudence. These are all, these are all the means to acquiring the values. But for me, the values are a, broadly speaking, a better, more secure, more enjoyable, reality for as many people as possible, starting with the people that I know and love personally, starting with my city, the place where I live and benefit from most directly, and then my state, my nation. Um, I don't know if, do you know 4-H? A 4-H by any chance? It's a youth vocational program. It's it's more common in rural areas, but the 4-H creed, which I might, I might get some words wrong here because it's been a while since I've done it, but it goes, it's 4-H, so there's, you know, the letter H. Um, what was it? I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my hands to larger works, my heart to greater loyalties. Let's see, head, hands, heart. And, oh, my, I got it. Okay, I pledge my, let's see, my, it, the last one is H for health, my health for better living. Um, my hands to greater works, my heart to larger service for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Uh, so you start with your immediate environs and then you go out from there. So that's how I think about pursuing my values as well. Um, hmm. I'll, I'll make New York City and New York State excellent for as many people as possible. And I think that's a reasonable thing for one person to take on. But if you say, even I'm going to save America or I'm going to save the world, like good heavens, um, 
or all beings or all beings that is a mighty task to take on and that is a lot to put on one person good thing we don't have to do it alone yeah good thing we don't have to do it alone there's something that's um digesting for me i'm going to trust my intuition here we're we're trying something new we're going to be playful today um, All right. So forgive me being if this is a little awkward or sloppy, but um, how to put it? I want to I want to like pause to reflect what I'm learning about you so far and how I'm characterizing you, because um, for starters, conversation is like psychoactive for me, and I think for everyone. But yeah, uh, whether or not they'd admit it, that's right. That's a different question. Uh, and I suspect that if I reflect to you how I'm seeing you so far, this conversation will like get dialed up in how psychoactive it is for both of us, basically. Um, that's my, that's my hypothesis. Um, uh, and I'm open to it being like very psychoactive. I, you, you set your comfort and safety levels wherever you like, but, uh, it's already psychoactive for me. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. You are someone who is incredibly intelligent in a conventional way, but that's fueled by curiosity, fundamentally. Uh, you're not interested in, yeah, conventional standards. Like you, you can do fine at those things. You're, you can be accomplished, but that's not what's making you tick. Um, yeah, incredibly bright and capable, curious mind. There's like a huge stack of books behind you. Uh, I imagine that you read a lot. Oh. Uh uh yes there's multiple there's multiple bookshelves that you can't see off screen of course of course uh and i read them all that's the other thing i was guessing that <laughs> i was guessing that uh and we'll we'll probably come back to that um you strike me as playful and not motivated by shame or guilt or fear or self-loathing um, and yet there's ambition and desire to accomplish things and create things, which to me seems motivated. Uh, here's the juicy part mm. by compassion for humanity. Does that seem true? Any of that seem true, wrong, missing anything? Um, no, none of it strikes me as wrong. Um, I do suppose it depends on what you mean by compassion. Mm. Um, a lot of people mean a lot of different things by the word. So I'd be interested to hear you say a little bit more about that. Um, Although it doesn't aware... strike me as wrong. I mean, um, one way to put it, like a Buddhist way to put it would be like awareness of suffering and the desire that it might be resolved. Um, another way to put it, which might be slightly more accurate for you is like an awareness that things could always be better. Uh, yes. Be... Well, I would say on that, that seems correct. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say also, um, so I, my motivations generally stated explicitly in my writing, but also how I feel are to have the better present and future. And that, how do you get that? There's two principal ways you get that you ameliorate the bad and you cultivate the good mm -hmm. and you have to do both. But I do think it's important to focus more on cultivating the good. I do. Why think do you have to do of, both? Well, they 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 come part and parcel. I don't I don't think you can ever destroy the bad. We are humans who have we're living beings who have to live on Earth. So there's always going to be problems to solve. Um, but some some people they pick one end of that. They'll say I will only cultivate whether or not they recognize it. I will only make things better, or I will only relieve the, the bad things. Yes. And again, like if you make a thing better, let's say you make a new medicine, you made it, you made something new, you exercised your creative and productive capacities. Well, that's going to ameliorate the bad. So hmm. these things often go together. Um, but I, I do, I do think it's important to recognize that the making the better things, that's typically the way forward. Sometimes your only option is palliation. Mm. Sometimes that's all you can do, in which case proceed. Mm -hmm. um, but I, that's, that's how I think about the relationship between those things. Um, Fascinating. And let's see, there was one more thought. 
And it was on the note of compassion. Perhaps say the thing that you said last. And then compassion maybe for humanity. Um, yes. Um, it is for humanity. And humanity is such abstract concept, um, at least for me, because I can't possibly know the teeming billions. Um, and so when I when I think about who this benevolence is extended to, it is to the teeming billions. Like who who am I, well, I would say who among us doesn't, but there are those among us who don't. Who among us doesn't have a vision of a happy, happier, healthier, more productive, safer humanity expanding throughout the stars? And or on Earth too, um, but it, it starts with the people that I know personally. And again, that that these things aren't mutually exclusive, um, and that goes back to the Elizabeth Barlow Rogers: "Don't try to save the world; just take the first step, and then the next." And so, for me, compassion for humanity begins with compassion, help, aid, productive collaboration, esteem with those around you. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is maybe the messy part, but let me see how I could do this. So I I absolutely have um how to put this a stance that I take in life is like I can learn from everyone, every single person, like every single moment, every single conversation, every single interaction, every single opportunity. And the more I do that, the more like the world is just like, whoa. Uh, and so I'm already like every phrase you're using, every tone of voice, like every suggestion you make is like, whoa, for me over here. And um, I think you kind of, I think someone has to kind of set their speed limit on how whoa they can get mm -hmm. uh, as it were. And um, I'm like currently experimenting with like, <laughs> turning up the gas pedal and right. um like i would invite you to come here with me and and specifically the direction my heart is called to is like um so i love i love take the first step i'm going to be looking that quote up the, the quotes you mentioned up later i'm very on board we we we're very in agreement about this i'm also very you know most of my projects tend to help people first um you know, that's, that's good. You know, like, and I love your project. I'm a huge fan. I mean, I'm, I'm already a fan from afar and I'm going to be even closer of a fan. It's like, great. No problems with the project. Um, and, uh, big admiration, big fan. And the, have you ever played a game, like a video game with like a map, like, um, of the territory? Like, uh, I mean, I played like Age of Empires 2 yeah, or something like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess my, my hypothesis is that, um, you're already like navigating the territory really well, like with your ambition and your values and the project. It's like, damn, like, as I said, one of the most ambitious people I know in my sphere right now. Um, and I'm like wanting you, I am desiring, and I'll own this, this is my desire is to like extend what the map is to include all beings, even if you're still helping the people around you first and foremost, and humans first mm -hmm. and foremost, like, can you expand that to animals, plants, the land, sentient beings anywhere, if they if there is sentience. In the start, actually, you were like, oh, consciousness. Anyway, um, like what if what if the walls itself were conscious? Like, I don't know, but um, no claims about that. But I'm like, oh, what would what would Daniel's world be like if um humanity expanded in scope to all beings? Yeah. What would it be like? Yeah, I wonder how you would live your life. Well, I mean, I don't, I, I would say all beings don't have to become humanity for that mm -hmm. to change. I mean, I, I grew up on a farm, so I grew up more well acquainted with the, with other living creatures than most people do. Mm -hmm. um, most, well, at least most Americans, but also still many people around the world. Most people don't grow up on farms. It's an incredibly vanishingly small minority of people. Um, I mean, a lot of people have pets, but animal husbandry or animal stewardship and stewardship of the land, stewardship of crops, growing them on purpose to be their best. What's the best way to do that? You can use things like you can use various poisons to kill bugs. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can cultivate and relate to the land, plants, animals, and a variety of other things. So I grew up amongst that. I still have 
people that I love and very much value who are still embedded within that. And that's still part of my worldview. So um, although I mentioned humanity, there are many other components of the world that are complementary to humanity mm -hmm. that we also require. We require the living systems of the earth to survive. Mm -hmm. um, there is, it's, what is it? It's a, it's a, I'm pretty sure it's a Francis Bacon quote, but it, it, I would have to double check that. And it might be one of these things that the internet has transmogrified out of nothing. Um, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. Hmm. So humans are a special kind of creature in that we have more creative capacity to transform the planet than any other thing here. Hmm. And that's generally speaking due to what we have going on up here. So, and we must survive just, just like any other creature, the, the fundamental choice often is life or death. And if you choose life, then the question is, well, what kind? And from there, all of ethics could unfurl if you wanted it to, hmm. because you've, you've chosen an ultimate standard against which to judge what is the right action to take life or death. If life, what kind? So other creatures are other creatures in the earth itself and the living systems are a part of this calculus. Hmm. Um, for example, and even artificial systems that we create are also increasingly part of this calculus. So if you are a human, um, recognizing that you rely on all these other things to survive and thrive, well, you want animals to have a nice life. You don't want them to be unnecessarily tortured for a variety of reasons. You do not want to be the torturer. Um, uh, similarly with like, uh, with an Alexa or something, um, occasionally you'll see an article about a child will start to become really curt or rude or domineering with, with an Alexa hmm. and a, a parent will feel something upon witnessing this and say, maybe be nicer. And I, I think the parent's instinct is correct because in general, my worldview virtue is not something you have, or it's not something you are. It is only ever something you do. It is the average of your habits. So uh, it's, it's, it's like, a, well, in many ways, this is very Aristotelian because it is. Um, it's like physical excellence. It's the same kind of thing. If you go into the gym and you try to pick up the heaviest weights your first time there, you're not going to be able to do it. But if you make a habit out of it, slow and steady cultivation, eventually you'll become very strong. And the same is true with other virtues. If you are honest regularly throughout your life, it's easier to be honest when it's hard. If you're courageous in the, the small daily ways that we can all be courageous, it's very easy to be the one person in the crowd that stands up and says no when the time comes, um, et cetera. Similarly, and all, all of this, for me, all the virtue, an important part of it can be seen in this moment with an Alexa or an animal or a river or something, which is how you interact with the thing matters for it, but it also matters for you. It impacts your virtue. If you choose to interact with an Alexa in a way that's rude, curt, domineering, you might think, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not a living thing, but that ignores the effect that it is having on, having on your habit and the ways that you're cultivating, interacting with the world, what you're reinforcing in yourself. And it doesn't matter if that is an Alexa. It doesn't matter if it's land or an animal or another person. Um, it it has an effect on how you are internally. So when I think about compassion towards humanity or how I view the world at large, I do often use the word humanity because I'm a human. And for me, humanity is foremost, but that does not mean separate. And it does not mean that the other things within the domain of reality do not deserve good consideration. Hmm. They're just different. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to really hear very clearly how you see things. And I'm learning a lot from that. And uh, I feel like my itch has largely been scratched for the time being uh here um happy to uh, as an aside do you consider yourself more agreeable or disagreeable um i i have my moments of both uh -huh. but i would say i come down generally i would come down on the 
agreeable side. Hmm. But again, for me, the, you know, of course, personality is not a monolith. It really depends on the context. Hmm. Um, because for me, the better part of courage requires being disagreeable. Hmm. So I imagine you would feel comfortable. Well, first off, you're very sweet. You're a very sweet person. Uh, I can already tell that. And um, I like sweetness. I'm I'm a sweetie myself. So the sweet can enjoy each other's company. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm, I, so this is one of the things that's sort of like rearranging itself in me right now. Um, historically, just very agreeable, conflict avoidant, uh, like the bad form of agreeable. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like an interview podcast where you just ask questions, it's hard to get into a fight, for example. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like, ooh, that's nice. That sounds nice <laughs> uh, for my past self. Um, and I'm imagining in this moment that like, one, you would feel comfortable like disagreeing. Yeah, I imagine you'd feel comfortable disagreeing with me, that you'd be like, I can stand for my own views and hear differences in opinion. And like, that would be okay. Like you wouldn't like, for example, go into a nervous system panic if, if there was disagreement, which hypothetically mm. someone might do. Yes. I most certainly would not. Uh -huh. Very good. Very good. I mean, I'm being a little bit self parodying of myself, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it is a, well, yeah. Anyway. And I also think there's a difference between disagreeability has many different manifestations. Mm -hmm. It's not just the most extreme hit you over the head with a two by four type of situation. Of course. Um, and as you say, there are many situations where it is fine for people to say the different ways that they think, and you can leave it there. Not everything, not everything has to be a fight, nor should everything be a fight and fight shouldn't be the frame. Disagreement can be the frame, but also it's possible to live within a, a realm of the suspension of judgment. Um, I, I wrote an essay in my personal stuff set called judge and be judged. Mm. And some things you must to judge is to evaluate. The options are as a result of that process, you approve, disapprove, or suspend judgment pending further information. And then the fourth one, which is kind of a version of the third is just to say immaterial. Mm. Uh, for example, if someone really prefers chocolate ice cream and you don't like it, do not be upset. <laughs> do not be upset at their preference for chocolate ice cream. So disagreement can can sometimes it can go to the level of chocolate ice cream versus vanilla in which case you just think ah the differences the kaleidoscopic differences that make humanity beautiful wonderful uh -huh. so it just it just depends yes well uh let's see yeah i love hearing how you think about that i love hearing how you think about anything um and what is it yeah, I'm inviting myself to be willing to be disagreeable, noticing that this is a safe context where you're a sweet person and it'll all be okay. And uh, what is it? Yeah, I like the frame of suspend judgment in particular, because I but basically my my feeling in this moment is that if we are real and share how we currently really see things and kind of put them next to each other, uh, like that will be... that. What, what was this metaphor use of like uh, this uh, earlier? And an alloy. Yeah, an alloy. Like ooh, an alloy versus a dichotomy. Yes. Like obviously we are different individuals and you know have different backstories and experiences and assumptions. But I'm like, ooh, that would be interesting to like just put them next to each other and see what wants to anyway, that's already happening, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm mm -hmm. putting that into shared awareness here. Um okay. Yeah, I, I mean, this is one of the things that makes I one of the reasons why I love government and politics so much because in any domain of decent size but also even in any friend group you have people who just live radically different ways mm. with pretty different worldviews although we we do share the same broad culture even if we might be in different subcultures um often i find myself thinking about many other people in new york city i do not like the way they live i do not want to live the way that they live. I'm glad they're on earth and I'm glad they're part of the city because they are needed just as much as me to make this whole thing what it is. Mm. And the that is true at the same, I, I do not dislike these people uh, for, or rather I often do actually, um, that is the right word to use. I do not like a lot of people, mm. but that doesn't mean that you have to in your in your heart when you think about them that doesn't have to be a bad thing it means i really don't want to do any of that uh aesthetically it is not my thing 
but assuming it doesn't violate some fundamental standard that I have for the way humans should live, often I just think to myself, again, human ecology is complex. It takes all kinds. I'm glad they're here, mm. generally speaking. I just wrote a tweet, which I'll post later, which is, uh, you don't have to like all beings to love them. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is which is sort of the same gestalt in my own system. Um, definitely don't like everyone. It'd be, I, it would be, I, I would aspire to like everyone. But, that's a lot of pressure. That's a that's save the world uh, energy. I think that would be pressure in your system, but it's it's exciting and uh, inspiring and uh, delightful in my system. Yeah. Well, it might also be a difference in how we're using the words because for me, connecting with understanding that sort of thing as many people as possible that has positive valence to me there we go there although we go i do although on a, you know honestly speaking I, I probably would not be able to like quite a lot of people uh in mm. terms of like you know i would in judgment would find much to condemn mm -hmm. possibly you know almost entirely or that sort of thing honestly speaking mm -hmm. but I, I i'm not trying to land there mm -hmm. fair i think uh yeah very fair yeah, like, um, like, I guess like in this sense is like enjoy their company or be able to have fruitful exchanges or interactions with like that are pleasant, um, like win-win. Like, yeah. it, I don't think it means like approve of or or like you want to live like them or uh, yes. agree yeah. with them or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's so interesting. I get the sense right now that like, uh, somehow we've arrived at very similar gestalts about things from very different backgrounds and perspectives. I'm like, Ooh, so interesting. Anyway. Um, I'm really, I'm really leaning into this whole thing, which is, which is, which is radical for this, this person, um, and this show, but here we go. Um, All right. thanks for, thanks for coming along with me. Um, mm -hmm. let me, let me go back to this story about grade inflation. I'm not sure I understood that. Can you can you describe again what happened with the A and the A minus and what bothered you so much about that at the time? Sure. Uh, well, grade inflation, broadly speaking, is just where there are pressures coming from a variety of places to give students higher grades. Mm. So generally, that's what that is. Well, what are the pressures that drive that up? Uh, part of it can be expectations from parents or donors, you know, why did my kid get this grade? Look at all this money I given to the school. Part of it can come from the students themselves. Why did I get, you know, because if, if you've come from a high school where you expect where you have gotten really good grades and now you land in college, possibly the standards have shifted, or maybe you, maybe you take a class that is different than what you've usually been, you've experienced, you might get a lower grade. A lot of people will want to push back on that if they've only ever gotten good grades. So they will push back. Maybe they demand a higher grade. Uh, there are also external sets of rankings for many colleges. Um, how well are your students doing? And so maybe you want to avoid having a whole bunch of people who fail or something. It's like graduation rates for high schools. Um, I think generally those in colleges, they're becoming, they're kind of useless metrics in a lot of ways, depending on the school, because places will just drop their standards until everyone graduates. So it's not really measuring what you would like it to measure. Um, so anyway, there's, but there's a wanting to have a really high graduation rate can put pressure on schools to either kick out the low performing people. So they're not in that calculation or give them higher, the higher grades they need to graduate. Even if, even if they didn't meet the previous set of standards. So Anyway, very multivariate. All these things can work together to push up grades where they would have been otherwise. So, um, and there's a there's a professor at Harvard. He actually just retired. He's 91, I believe. His name is Harvey C. Mansfield. Uh, massive fan. Um, he's 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 a liberal artist of the old guard. Um, fluent to the point of translational authority in many languages. If you get some a copy of Machiavelli or de Tocqueville or something, often it's translated by Harvey Mansfield. Um, he had the the nickname Harvey C minus Mansfield because he, you know, he'll give you two grades. Um, one of them is the grade that you would get in his class if it were any other class, if it were according to the prevailing um, inflated grade standards. The other one is the grade you deserve. It will likely be lower. 
And this is not out of, he's not being mean. Uh, and in fact, he was quite popular as a teacher because students in one way or another recognize that this grade inflation is going on. And so if you get an A under a grade inflated regime, you don't really feel, it's it's quite common to not really feel like you earned it um, because probably you, you know, there's a good chance you didn't. But in class, like in Mansfield's classes, Professor Mansfield's classes, you get that second grade. And sometimes, uncommonly, it will be a B or an A, in which case you think, I did good work and I nailed it. Good. Mm -hmm. Sense of achievement. And it ma it matches what went into it. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily have that in a lot of other classes. So that's, but broadly speaking, throughout Harvard College, great inflation runs rampant. And there's a lot of different ways you could feel about that. As I said, when I got onto campus, I felt very bad about it because I was really just mad at other people because they were getting things they didn't, I thought they didn't deserve. And their grades looked like my grades, even though I worked very hard. And I also thought that was unfair. Is that, uh, is others, that what happened with your friend's paper that like yes. they got an A minus, even though they're in your view, it, their paper it, was much worse. Right. That's what happened there. I see. Um, but again, if you sort of pause and then take that apart, which I did, it took me a little bit, but I did. And I thought, well, them get, let's say I, let's say they did not deserve that higher grade. <laughs> What's that got to do with me mm. <laughs> at the end of the day? Uh, that, I mean, it has larger impacts on the ecosystem of the college. I'm not denying any of that, but I'm, I'm living here in my own body. What well, I don't have to be bothered by that. Mm. I don't have to import bad feeling or ill will towards them into my own heart as a result of this. But like I said, it took me, took me a couple, three semesters to fully settle, fully integrate that set of feelings and to have them be compellingly, sincerely held. I imagine that part of it at the time was a sense of like, oh, do I really deserve this A if this person got an A minus? Like, what does that even mean? Is that the case? Well, I, I actually, that wasn't really a, as large an issue for me because I really did. You like felt that, you deserved the A. In that particular case, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, I worked extremely hard. Um, and there were a couple of classes that didn't have great inflation in the same way. Um, there were a few narrow holdouts. Hmm. Um, and there still are a few narrow holdouts. Uh, it's harder to inflate some areas than others. It's mm -hmm. easier to inflate qualitatively evaluated fields, hmm. um, which unfortunately means the humanities have borne the brunt of this. Um, but of course, you can inflate quantitative, quantitatively evaluated fields with, uh, you can use curves. You can grade classes on curves. Um, Sometimes, you know, that's a strategy that maybe can work in some context. But in any way, no one is immune from grade inflation, but some subjects are more resistant to it than others. One of them was the German department when I was there. Um, I studied German as an undergrad, and I took intensive introduction to German, which is two semesters crunched into one. You had class every day, sometimes twice a day. I remember doing four hours of homework for the first two weeks of that class every day. It was insane. <laughs> um, and the very first class we had, like 27 people show up on day one. And the instructor was incredibly candid and just said, most of you are going to be gone within a week or two. That was true. Six, I believe six of us finished that class. But I got the, the there was, they gave out a certificate at the end of the semester. It was like best student. I got that certificate. Um, I don't remember exactly what, I don't think it said, it was not best student, but it was something like, um, highest achievement or something like that. Anyway, I got an A in that class and I definitely earned it mm -hmm. and was very proud of it, extremely proud. And I could tell, you know, you can validate these things because I was in a, I was functionally, conversationally fluent in German after one semester, worked really hard, did the mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And, and then later when I went to um, Heidelberg to work as an au pair, served me very well. So anyway, that's, that's how I think about the great inflation. That's what was going on there. I see. That's very helpful. Um, let's go to New York. Uh, I love to go to New York. Love to stay here. Yes. 
Why? Well, as I mentioned, I came I came here when I was 15. I turned 16 here, magic. Uh mm. for so I came here for a, a national competition for parliamentary procedure, which continues to serve me well to this day. Um I still love it. Um I use it. Um so when I was here, I wrote well, I'll I'll start by saying this how I came here literally on a Greyhound bus fits a certain American narrative. That American narrative is alive because it's real, not made up. Uh, so my mother drove me to Indianapolis. Uh, that's where the bus was leaving from. And as I was getting out, she had never been outside of Indiana or Ohio or uh, or for one brief stint, Texas. And as I was getting on the bus, you know, pulls me in for the last hug and says, don't forget to look up. Hmm. Because she, like me, had gotten to new, know New York through books and knew that the city's vertical dimension is something you shouldn't forget about. And in general, most people can appreciate the idea that if you live in a place, it can become standard. You can start to ignore all of the everyday magic. So she'd never been to New York, but she also recognized that that happens to people even in New York. But I was very excited. So um, got on the bus. Came to New York, rode the subway, magic, saw the people, witnessed the vertical majesty of the city, which to this day never ceased to amaze me. I look at skyscrapers the same way today that I did then. Hmm. And I also saw my first musical. It was Hairspray. And I can only describe that it was a transcendent experience. I can only describe the feeling I had sitting in that seat as a positive panic attack, a good hmm. one as a nervous system overload, did not know what to do. I noticed an overwhelming sensation kind of makes you want to go to the hospital because you're, it's so much, but it was a good feeling. I had never seen that kind of choreographed musical presentation, really any presentation that was just such, so full of delight, uh, choreographed everything, energy, movement, music, and it hit me right in the soul. So, um, I, st I mean, I love musicals to this day. And so my experience, my very first experience in New York was unforgettable, transcendent, and it is what kept me anchored here for the rest of my life after that, until I could eventually make my way here. You know, life intervenes. You can't always do what you want, but I did eventually get here and that's... That's the that's the why of New York, because it has so many things that regularly inspire a sense of the sublime in me every day. Do you have any, uh, how to put it? How would you characterize your relationship with the different boroughs? Well, I, you, you can only live in one and get to know them in that intimate way at any one time. I've lived in Manhattan. I, when I first moved here, I lived in Manhattan. And then now I live in Brooklyn. Um, I would eventually like to make my way back to the Upper West Side, which is my favorite neighborhood. But I live with wonderful people. And you can, it's hard to find all your people clustered together. You can, you know, you can endeavor to do that. Um, I think, you know, Andrew and Priya, they... Have create they have clustered the people and I can go to the Upper West Side, but you know the people are here at the moment, so I'll be with the people, hmm. um, and I and I do return to the Upper West Side quite frequently, um, but I love all five boroughs. In in the same manner and for the same reason that I love all of America, hmm. which is to say they are different in many different ways. Their histories are different. The city consolidated in 1898. So prior to 1898, when you said New York City, that referred to Manhattan and the Bronx. That is, that's the area that was within New York County and was the city of New York. Brooklyn was separate. Queens as an entity didn't exist. It was just many small towns that were in Queens County. And Staten Island, of course, similar thing. Um, so the boroughs are all very different. I visit them all pretty regularly. Of course, some of them like, you know, you're you're constrained by what you're near. So when I step out my door, obviously I visit Brooklyn more now because I'm here, but uh, I love all five boroughs. I want the best for all of them. 
that's in general. And I enjoy all of them. All of them have wonderful things to experience. They're all great places to live. Um, that doesn't mean you'll live the same way in all of them. And even within each borough, high variation. Some places you don't want to live in any borough, other places you want to live more. Hmm. So there's variation between boroughs and within them. You could probably, there's probably more variation within a borough than there is between most of them. What do you love about the Upper West Side? Uh, families and that there are families and children everywhere. Hmm. that there are a ton of tall apartment buildings. Hmm. I love to be up high. Hmm. Um, like I said, I enjoy where I live now. I'm on the th I'm sitting in my room on the third floor of a townhouse. But if I could be in, a, in an apartment on the 40th floor, oh, I would love it. So in addition to just, uh, in addition to loving living, you know, high in the sky, I also just like to, I like witnessing, or I, I like walking around and having buildings go straight up. Hmm. Um, and the way they do that on the Upper West Side hits me very well. I wish they were taller. I wish there were more. And of course, Central Park on one side, Riverside Park and the Hudson on the other. Hmm. Merely one of them, you know, possibly America's preeminent green jewel right in your backyard or as your backyard. Okay. Now that we have set the stage of New York, uh -huh. let's dive in more deeply. Uh, how would you describe the anti-politics meme? The anti-politics meme is the conflation of bad politics with all politics. Hmm. That's the phenomenon. And most people don't realize that they're doing this. Um, that's why, you know, I say meme, it's a thing that's transmitted from one person to another, and maybe they're not even consciously aware of it. So to validate this concept, I just ask people to pay attention to the way they use politics in everyday language and pay attention to the way that other people use politics in everyday language. And the common examples that I mentioned in the original essay that I wrote, but I think are familiar to many people are things like, uh, with regard to anything in life. If it doesn't go well, if a process doesn't go well, like let's say hiring, someone might say, oh, it was such a political process. What does that mean? Clearly, they're using politics as a synonym for bad. They could be more specific. For example, did someone hire their nephew or their niece who is not really qualified for the job? Well, you can use the word nepotistic. No need to drag the good art of politics into this, this is mm. something that I would say. Uh, generally, most people don't actually mean social rulemaking, which is what I mean when I say the word politics. It's just social rulemaking, just. Uh, it can go any number of ways. So mm. it was such a political hiring process. Well, what you mean is nepotistic. Mm. That's what you mean. Or uh, the phrase political correctness, no matter who is using it, it means bad. It means we are not saying what's true. People on of all political valences use this phrase. Interestingly, they all mean the same thing by it. Hmm. Uh, what people say is not true. And there's this, you know, you can speak more frankly. You can be not politically correct. So in that, you know, politically correct means to obfuscate, to hide the good truth. Um, you know, the the list, the list can go on. But generally speaking, the way people use the word is it's just a, it's different synonyms for bad. And if you could free someone's mind when they use that word and look there, you will just see kind of bad. It really is just kind of this hazy. It didn't go well. It was bad. It's not what you want. And it has nothing to do with a really sharp articulation of how we make social rules together. Hmm. You know, what are the rules? How do we make them? Who makes them? This is the field of politics. This is the field of political philosophy. Um, it's it's not, it, it cannot, and it should not be boiled down to bad. That's how I view it. That's the anti-politics meme. So the anti-politics meme is a meme, an idea that spreads from person to person, group to group, that conflates good and bad politics. In your view, politics is simply social rulemaking, and you can do that more or less effectively. Better or worse. Better or worse. Or Ill. 
what in your mind and your heart characterizes good politics? Well, and in fact, that's how I end the anti-politics essay. Uh, it's a test to see if mm. you're infected, which mm. is, can you think of a concrete example of excellent politics? Mm -hmm. If not, that's a good indication that the meet, you're within the, you're enthralled to the meme. For me, excellent politics, social rulemaking, means it's kind of it's a lot of what we have discussed already. It is recognizing that other people exist and must be taken into account. They are not to be steamrolled. Um, they are not pawns on a chessboard. They are not merely means to an end for whatever your end might be to achieve or design society. That doesn't mean that you don't disagree with them, and that doesn't mean if you get more votes than them that you sim you know that you don't overrule them, but it does mean that you keep them in mind as important, as consequential, um, respectfully. It means that you must start from that place. And good politics tries to create, well, government politics anyway. There are politics in any group of people, two or more. Friend groups have politics, social rulemaking. Their rules are called norms. Workplaces have workplace politics their rules are split between norms and a written codified handbook. The government has politics, but it's special because its rules are called laws, which are distinct and we must all follow, are all subject to enforcement. So when I say politics here, I'm, I'm that's shorthand for government politics. Um, so what are good politics there? Well, it's creating wise laws that help humanity flourish. Hmm. The creation of the best regime and well, what are those laws? That's, you know, that's a whole branch of philosophy. How do we pick those, that sort of thing? But broadly speaking, that's good politics. You try to, you create the law and enforce the law that allows humanity to flourish. Or to, uh, to use one very good quote from, there's a Harvard law professor from the earlier part of the 20th century. Um, what it, what is the law? The law is the, the law is those wise constraints, which set us free. Something I'm seeing in how you're characterizing this is it's um, seems like you're providing an alternate frame to the conventional frame of politics that you see as more useful and can spread widely, but isn't actually very opinionated. Like, I imagine you have opinions about what makes good politics for yourself that you would like, you know, yeah. in a world what are where the you good, were... Yeah. What are the good social rules? I absolutely uh -huh. have opinions on that. Yes. Um, so I appreciate that. And I'm curious how you would characterize your own political philosophy like for yourself, like what you would vote for, what would you, you would legislate if you were governing that, uh, that kind of thing? Well, I would, I would first start by saying, so a, a lot of people do ask me this mm -hmm. and when they ask implicit in their head is who would you vote for president? What do you think should be going on in the federal government? I'm actually, not, you know, it's interesting. Not necessarily you... saying what's going on here, but yeah, go ahead. Um, um, yeah, I'm, you, you, you talked about like friend groups, workplaces, uh, governments and I'm mm -hmm. actually more interested in like friend groups and workplaces oh, okay. than governments. So yeah. like how you how you relate to those things, but but also governments and you know presumably there'd be a world where you ran for office and, and like I imagine you're not choosing to do that currently, but like have considered what that would look like. And mm -hmm. like I'm I'm also interested in like how that Daniel would govern. But no, not we can set aside federal yeah. global stuff for now. Well, so for you know what is good social rulemaking. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Um, to really grapple with this requires a developed sense of ethics. Mm. Ethics is what is what is good for me. Politics is essentially interrelation between people. I mean, it's social rulemaking. It is interpersonal relation. And if you do not have a cultivated sense of how you should operate, it is going to be very difficult to say how should you operate with other people. Uh, against which standard, if you're not even sure what you're supposed to do or what is good, good and right and proper for yourself. So um, in general, this all relies on my my system of ethics, which is fundamentally based on a certain conception of value and virtue that mm. is proper. Um, so when I think about what is good politics, what is good interrelation, it often hinges on the same virtues that you would find in my ethics, which is honesty, which does not mean stating baldly the truth. It means fidelity to reality. Hmm. Um, it means not ignoring the dictates of reality. 
you know, most people, when they say honesty in their, in their head, they think verbally stating the truth. Um, sure. But that is different than, a, an intellectual or, a an emotional orientation towards do not ignore reality. Hmm. Um, even if it is shocking, surprising, something you don't want. That's hmm. fundamentally what I mean by honesty. Act according to what is true in the world. Uh, do not ignore it. Don't push it away. Um, so in any case, good politics requires honesty. If you want to make rules in a friend group, for example, um, and other virtues come into play here too. Good politics requires honesty because maybe your friends adopt a behavior that is not good. Maybe it's self-destructive. Maybe it's mean. Maybe it makes you feel bad. Maybe they start making bad jokes at your expense. Hmm. Well, what do you do about that? Uh, for a lot of people, tough situation because now you have to confront a friend, and you're you know you might be surprised and shocked that they're acting this way, and now you you have that feeling in your gut that you need to look them in the eye, and you need to tell them, in some fashion, this is wrong, and you need to stop, and you need to change, and you need to do it this way. Uh, so first, a lot of people might just shove it down. Like, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to experience it. I'm just going to shove it down. Well, honesty says, no, no, don't. Might be uncomfortable, but recognize what's happening here. Uh, then the other virtues come into play. Courage is also going to come into play here. Now you have to tell them. Hmm. Now that you, now you have to address it. And other virtues continue to come into play here. Uh, prudence. How do you tell them? What is the best way to tell them so that you will be heard and understood hmm. in the in the most productive way? So you can you know you can see all the virtues tend to they need to, you need to cultivate all of them because they all come to be useful and in most situations you need all of them to productively handle a lot of things. So I mean I'm speaking somewhat generally here because I'm just talking about why these virtues are necessary for. The politics of a friend group but you can operationalize it too um like i said for for honesty it just means don't ignore it don't do that thing that we all know where you witness a piece of reality and you just you just look away you just ignore it don't do that hmm. um you don't have to beat yourself up for maybe doing it for the first half second because it's kind of natural i don't want to see the bad thing but then okay deep breath bring yourself back and I mean, you, I'm sure you, you've thought about this a lot as well. There's a, you can cultivate maybe a sense of embodied practices, a set of intellectual stances. There's an operate, there's a way to operationalize honesty here. So to me, these kinds of things exist in all of the realms of politics. Hmm. Would it be possible to characterize this perspective as a school of political philosophy? as a school of political philosophy. Hmm. I would call it possibly neo-Aristotelian, but there are other things to discuss that would change, that would probably change that characterization depending on who you're talking to. I possibly my, one of my favorite political philosophers is Machiavelli, mm -hmm. who I think is unjustly maligned. It's just, yeah. Uh, mostly because people have not actually read him. They just sure. use the word Machiavellian as a... Or if they've read him, they've just read The Prince. Yes, but Discourses on Livy is actually my yeah. favorite book of his. Yes. So, um, for example, and he has an art, he has his own art of war. Um, it's not just Klaus Witzen, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's, Machiavelli has one too. Um, so um, I would, in general, say the useful thing to get out of Machiavelli is a brutal look at that which is the case mm. and his recommendations well like the prince even the prince I think people take away something I don't take away from it uh what I take away from the and you know there's context who was he writing to yes. why was he writing it but uh the prince is more like what are your goals here what do you want to achieve okay well here, here's how, here is how reality is. Here is how the people respond. There's a difference between swooping in and displacing an existing regime and growing into an existing regime in terms of your relation to the people, how they accept you as legitimate. 
uh, new order, new orders versus old, for example, that's been going around on Twitter. But the for me, the crux of the prince is look reality straight into the face and aim unflinchingly at it. Mm. And to a lot of people, just that idea itself comes across as malign because malignant people take advantage of the affordances of reality. They have a clear idea of what makes people tick and they use that to beat them down to control them. But you do not have to be malignant to embrace that view. So I would hesitate to characterize what I think about politics in terms of a school of philosophy, partially because I have not written anything that has articulated that. So I would have to think about it more. But I <laughs> I can tell you philosopher, you know, just like I've done so far, I can tell you philosophers that I think have good things to say. Mm -hmm. Productive that answers things to the say. question. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else worth naming besides those two? There, there are so many. Um, <laughs> Greatest because, hits. Yeah, so many people have had great things to say. So um, Aristotle is a perennial favorite. Oh, I don't know how it did that. Uh, New feature. Oh, is, is my video frozen on your end? It seems to be it frozen is, on yes. my end. Oh, interesting. Let me turn my video off and turn it back on. There we go. There we go. So Aristotle has always sat very well with me. Machiavelli, the American founders, quite a lot of the American founders, the Federalist Papers remain foundational for me in a lot Incredible. of ways. Um, I mean, I could speak at length about the American founding. I think, you know, in, in the modern day, many Americans do not appreciate what actually happened there hmm. for the good, the bad, and the strange. Hmm. It's just a wildly different thing than that a lot of them think. And much, much more went well than most people are aware of. Much more was so highly contingent and hinged upon highly capable people doing the right thing in the face of severe adversity and headwind. But um, uh, in the modern day, Ayn Rand, and that, you know, that punches a lot of people right in the face. But I, I would also say, um, I would just ask them to read her books. Uh, mm -hmm. I think she has a lot of interesting things to say about human nature. Actually, more, more human nature than what is the best regime, mm -hmm. for example. And in fact, I actually don't think she has much productive to say about what operationally is the best regime. I mean, she herself didn't even take on that role. She she saw herself as a political philosopher, not a politician. And she mm -hmm. drew a distinction between those things. So, and again, like I, I do think most people think she has uh, her books, her fiction especially, have uh, that they prescribe a certain set of laws or a certain way of doing things. And a lot of that comes up in her fiction versions of it. But she did not see herself as a politician. She saw herself as um deriving good principles to use that would guide the concrete application or production of law for example so those are those are some people with that distinction i'm characterizing you in my head as neither a politician nor a political philosopher but a political educator would you agree with that well yes for foremost right now you could put political educator there, but why am I doing? Why have I chosen political education? Why have I chosen to set up a civic school? Mm -hmm. It is because I have a wider political philosophic view of the world and a theory of why things work the way they do in government and law. And that theory said, one of the fundamental bottlenecks fully upstream of many of our problems is that so very few people understand the government and law and they have no way to learn. And in fact, they are incentivized to bullshit about it. Um, because, you know, let's say you get a job in the government. Maybe you're elected, appointed, hired. You've had that job for five years. And now all of a sudden, maybe maybe you let the honesty through and you realize you don't actually know what the city charter is mm. and how it relates to the state constitution or whatever. You don't actually know what the system is. Well, are you going to ask a government 101 question now? Mm. Uh, prob no, people will not. They feel social pressure to not go back to square one. So um, there is a there is a philosophy. There's a theory of government behind why I'm doing this. Hmm. So uh, something 
you made a distinction there too was in terms of time like now and then implicitly in the future um if you adopt Ayn Rand's distinction there between politician and political philosopher feel free to propose an alternative would your long-term ambitions tend towards politics or political philosophy politics mm -hmm. is there um, a world where you would run for office we live in that world ah oh, very good Excellent. Are you running uh, for office currently? I am not currently running for office. Uh, I But in general, I encourage, there are many different things to run for. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I often discuss with people is there are a lot of elections that no one pays attention to. They're mm -hmm. so small. And if you lose, no one will ever notice. <laughs> well, probably. Um, and it is worth, it's worth running for something for a couple of reasons. Number one, you now introduce into your social graph the knowledge of how to run and what is required and how it works, what happens. Hmm. Right now, that knowledge is possessed by essentially no one. Hmm. You know, there's the people who volunteer on campaigns. Um, although I'll say even they don't actually understand a lot of what's happening. They're just taking marching orders. Um, but for if we are going to live in a self-governing society, more people need to not be afraid of running and more people need to understand what's actually happening when someone is running. Hmm. Um, so I think people should run for many more things much more often. Um, and there's a better, there's a good way to do that that accommodates a lot of people's fears, financial constraints, et cetera. What are the conditions that would need to be in place for you to run for an office personally? Well, Part of it would be, do I have a theory of why me holding this particular office can achieve certain outcomes that I think are good? Mm -hmm. And and is me holding that office worth the opportunity cost of what I could be doing otherwise? Mm -hmm. Because the, the goal is achieve the good things that I think are good in society. Mm -hmm. You don't have to hold elected office to do that. Um, but it might be necessary. Some things you do have to hold elected office to do. So then the question is, well, assuming that you land in that seat, whatever that elected seat is, do you think you would be efficacious? And this is very, this very clearly does not enter a lot of people's heads. Most, a lot of um, people who run for office get in their seat and they realize that they do not know what this job is at all. Mm. And now they start to learn. I talk to a lot of these people. Um I mean, I've I've talked to many people who have run for Congress and they haven't even read the Constitution. Hmm. And there's something interesting. I, to me, there's a lot of things going on there. But isn't it interesting? The set of norms that we have inculcated, I also think the anti-politics meme a little bit, the lack of knowledge of how it all works. It's so potent that even people running for these offices will not read like an 8,000 word document or something. Hmm. Even the one that, is very important to their job. Um, so in broad strokes, I would run, I have thoughts, but it is not yet concretized uh, because it's, do you have a theory of whether or not you can do the thing once you're in the chair? And is it worth the opportunity cost? What could you be doing instead? Could you be helping someone who already is in that seat? Hmm. Is that a better way of doing it? And all these things are things that float around my head. Mm -hmm. If I don't usually speak this way, but probabilistically, what's the likelihood that you would run for office from 0% definitely won't happen. Sounds like it's not that to 100%. It's absolutely certain, which it also sounds like it's not that like, where, where are you in between those two extremes? You could say 70, 80%. Ah, juicy. As in juicy. probably would. Uh -huh. But as to when and what? very much still needs to be very much still thinking about it. Understood. Uh, do you have a, so you've created Maximum New York and you are the leader of some type of this project. Uh, do you have a role in the fractal orbit? A role? Like a leadership role. Well, you know, one would have to ask, 
Andrew and Priya about a, a lot of this, but uh, I mean, there's no, there's not a formal structure mm -hmm. here. So certainly I don't possess a formal title, um, uh -huh. but I'm a, I'm a node in that social graph. I yeah. think, I think that's the way that you would characterize roles. Are you a node in the social graph and which kind are you and how many connections do you have? And mm. at least which that's kind are you in it. that social graph? My, well, I have probably a medium to lower than average amount of inter-graph connections. I have many connections that extend out into the graph or extend out into the wider world of New York City, you know, as do many people, but mine tend to go in the government direction, government and mm -hmm. civics. That is not common. Mm -hmm. So the way that my node works is it, it marries, it imports government and civics into the social graph. Mm. That is, I would say, I mean this in the most descriptive way possible. How would you describe the cluster of the social graph around fractal? Well, highly variable. That's That's certainly true. It is filled with a lot of people who are trying to live life on their own terms hmm. and trying to figure out how to do that. Maybe they've already figured out how to do it. Um, I would, I broadly speaking, I would say that. Hmm. I mean, it's a throwback to the earlier part of the conversation, but it is people who are trying to do that thing if they have not already done that thing. Hmm. And once it's, it's always, it's a continued process. How do you live life on your own terms? So hmm. There are many different ways to do that. So it is a lot of people trying to do that in their own way, doing hmm. that in their own way. How would you characterize the social graph of New York City? Good heavens. Um, I often think that this is not exact, this is not literally true, but New York is a fractal of America. And large is obvious. Well, it's very large. It is large. It is very large. It is very dense. It is larger and denser than anywhere else in the country. Um, it has a history that I wish more of its residents knew about, hmm. but most do not. Um, if they knew that history, I think they would be far more optimistic. And I'm speaking of political history specifically here. Mm -hmm. um, well, New York is... It's, it is many different things. E.B. White wrote a book called Here is New York... And there's a, as, as famous as that book is, probably the most famous part of it is where he says there are roughly three New Yorks and he describes them. And there is the New York of the person who grew up here, the New York of the commuter, and then the New York of the person who came here in search of a dream for whom the city is a quest and a destination. And he has things to say about what, what all three of them give to the city. In his estimation, he says the third, which I am a part of, he says that of these three cities, the greatest is the last, the third. Mm. Um, I think you need you need all three, just like in any place, you need all three. Like, and he does describe why all three are necessary and what they give to the city. So, um, the people who were born here, who live here their whole lives, they give it a certain sense of solidity and continuity. Um, the people who the commuters, I mean, they they bring commerce, they bring a lot of other things. Um, and then the people who come here from all over in search of a dream, they give it, well, that that's where the magic comes in. Um, New York is known as a place where people come to chase their dream because so many of us have come here to chase the dream or to live the life that we would like. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing that, we make New York even more accommodating to more people who do that. Be it's a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. Because the city is filled with so many people who do that, if you do do that, you will, you're not going to have a lot of people thinking, oh, who is that guy to think he can X, Y, Z. I mean, you still have people here who think that. Um, but you have many other people that you can interact with who think, oh, yes, of course. Hmm. And you have them from all three New Yorks because that's the city's culture so strongly. Hmm. How would you characterize New York's role as a node 
in the graph, social graph of America? Well, again, to quote E.B., to paraphrase E.B. White from Here is New York, um, he was talking about Manhattan, although, and I think it, you could say all five boroughs, but Manhattan is like the white church steeple at the center of the village. It is there pointing the way up. Hmm. Hmm. And I think New York is the same, which is not to say that there is no other place that is, many places are important in America. Many places are good, but they have different roles in effect. And so goes New York, so goes America. Um, if New York were to collapse, if it were to fail, imagine the spiritual impact on all of America. Hmm. Um, it would be horrendous. It, it would be a case of blood poisoning that spreads quickly everywhere, and then uh, who knows what would happen. Um, it would be cancer, LOL. Hmm. Um, so... I think uh, I think New York is New York is part of the part and a very important part of the soul of America. It embodies well. It in fact, it is as America is to the world. New York is to America. The Statue of Liberty welcome the Statue of Liberty doesn't just welcome people from the world. It welcomes people from everywhere within the country. There are immigrants, foreign and domestic. That's what New York, that's what New York embodies. That very potent specific version of the American dream, that specific version of America as an ideal, that is New York. That's what it does for America. It upholds that ideal and that dream hmm. most potently. How would you characterize Steelman charitably view the other major nodes in America? Like, for example, I'm in the Bay Area right now. How would you characterize mm -hmm. the Bay Area? How would you characterize the other one? Almost like if they were organs of the larger thing, like what are the different functions of the organs as you see them? Yeah. Well, I think it's very clear. I mean, I, as I said, my, often my love for New York is not, it is. it does not require other people to make a choice. I mm -hmm. don't phrase it as a choice for other people. I want everyone to love where they live the mm -hmm. way that I love New York. Mm -hmm. That is what I want for them. Mm -hmm. That is what I want for their places. Um, that said, you know, places are different. The Bay area clearly clusters a lot of software talent, mm -hmm. uh, not as much hard tech. That's a separate story that seems to be coming along in El Segundo in Los Angeles these days. But mm -hmm. you know, what do I know about that? Um, the Bay area is obviously incredibly special. It is, it is in terms of American ideals. It's so very strongly entrepreneurial you know, go West young man. It's a, it's that it is that, which is go into adventure, go make your way in the world, go create something. See if you can make it big. And this is not unrelated to what New York is, but I, you know, I do think there's a, there's a distinction here. Uh, be, I think the Bay area is that. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. Of course, uh, you know, the difference is New York. There's just more here. You can, you can find a technologic ecosystem here. I don't think it pulls mm -hmm. the same way as the Bay Area, but also in New York, you can find, you know, pretty much pretty much everything else uh, as well. That's one of the reasons why it's different. But uh, I don't, I don't definitely don't want to. I mean, my tendency is not to stack rank. Of course. Yeah, I think places. I think you're answering a slightly different question than the one I want, uh, like yeah. being very specific about the Bay Area in particular. And also, I'm, I'm not asking like which one's better or worse or something. Yeah. Um, like but the Bay, the Bay Area is a certain kind of bold entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. bold feeling of entrepreneurialism. Great. What what um, how would you characterize it? So like Portland, Austin, Asheville and any other cities in the states that you'd like to add to that list how would you characterize them respectively hmm. let's see well i'm limited to well i suppose i'm not limited to the places i've lived anyone can speculate about places mm -hmm. that they have i'm lived, interested but... in your speculations opinions perspectives your sense yep. making um i would say there are many places that do not have a strong they're not a load-bearing pillar of the american spirit 
Mm. but they are a manifestation and a lived example of it. Mm. And just as integral to the nation. Um, so I grew up in Wayne County, Indiana, lots of farms. Uh, I think in the whole county, there's like 65,000 people. It's much larger than the five boroughs, but far fewer people. Um, I'm glad it's in America. It's just as much a part of the fabric. Um, do I think it's a hub of entrepreneurialism? No, it would be, uh -huh. it, it would be disingenuous and dishonest to say that it is. Do I think that it, uh, calls to people flock, gets them to flock there to chase whatever their dream is? Definitely. No, it doesn't. Hmm. Uh, there are distinctions between places like that and places like New York city or the Bay, but are there people there who are living their own version of the American dream um, because they own a house mm. and they live with dignity and they have uh, you know, a small town that has a wonderful history that goes back to, I don't know, 1800 or something. And they have family that goes back and they value that and that their story is welcomed into American culture, just like everyone else's. That mm. too is America. Uh, let me pause you for a second. Uh, imagine if we sw shifted scales and I was like, okay, you have a friend group, you know, yeah. Andrew, Priya, some other people. And I was like, just tell me about your friends. What's this one like? What's this one like? You like all of them. They're all great. Like, that's kind of the question I'm asking you, but on the like nation scale. And let's add DC as well. Um. So let's see. Uh, Priya is great. She grew up. Oh, grew no, up I'm asking about the, the, the national scale. Like, the national Asheville, Asheville DC Austin um yeah. I, I'm very curious actually about the folks at fractal but we're talking about the yeah, yeah. The, the federal the, local government the grand stuff. federal system yeah um uh, let's see so generally speaking in America one of the a thing that lives in the interrelation of places mm -hmm. is if something is not going well in one place, you can go to a place that's doing it well. You can mm -hmm. reward the places that do the thing that you think should be done. Mm -hmm. And that is true with both the law and a variety of other things. I mean, more than most people know, most law is made, executed, and adjudicated at the state level. Mm -hmm. Um, people sort of th have this idea of DC in their head as this Leviathan that controls everything and it controls a lot, but it doesn't control everything. Mm -hmm. So within the interrelation between places, they can help course correct each other. Uh, for example, the Bay in New York, one of the things that is bad about them is they just absolutely refuse to build any new housing. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people, small, I think it's a small minority who use their um, political power in the political system to block it, block the construction of new housing. That makes the cost of living and rent very expensive. And that pushes out a lot of people who otherwise would like to live here and chase their dream. Well, where do they go? We can see in migration patterns where they go. They go to Texas, they go to Florida, they go to many other places. So what about Texas and Florida? If this is answering your question, this mm. is how I think about it. What about Texas and Florida? Well, there are a lot of people who want to live in Florida because it comports with the way that they want to live their life. There are a lot of people who are moving to Texas and Florida because they were in New York. They'd like to stay, but they can't make it work. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they've they've had children and it's now it's very expensive for apartments that can host families. The Those rents are being outcompeted by a group of adult roommates who also have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. This is the best they can get. Well, this can push out families and it's no one's fault except the people who refuse to build new housing um so in the first instance places like texas and florida give other they give other people the opportunity to live more the way they would like it can accommodate them that's that kind of correction mechanism exists between states okay well what about them intrinsically what about like texas or austin intrinsically um they often, I mean, they're just a, they're another fusion point of many different cultures. Like clearly many people go many places in America to chase the dream. Although again, I think New York is a special instance of it, but people go to Austin because there's a certain social scene there. There's an idea that something is happening. Maybe my people are there. I'd like to go find them. And 
Austin serves a version of that purpose and it has a it has a different culture. So if you want to chase the dream and do the do whatever it is you want to do, live life on your own terms, well, maybe you don't actually want to do that in New York. Maybe you were pushed out, but also maybe New York isn't your thing. Uh, so you have to go find the place that will accommodate you in chasing your dream that is more your place. And Austin is that for a lot of people, for example. I appreciate that answer. Part of what I'm hearing is, uh, well, a reticence to characterize specific cities and awareness of the meta pattern of like why people go or leave particular cities. Uh, say more. Mm. I think a lot about the shape of questions and characterize like almost like an ontology of quest kinds of questions. And I'm always, I'm curious about shapes of questions. And um, there's a specific kind of question I'm trying to ask you that um, you, you've said things that are relevant to it, but you haven't quite answered yeah. it. And I'm also uh, that feeling. that's interesting to me. It's like, oh, am I not asking it well? Is it too complicated a question? Do you not want to answer this intrinsically? I'm not really sure, but you have said interesting and relevant things, which I can be satisfied with. I mean, in my view, not not every place does the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I would hesitate to say some places are some places are more distinct than others, mm -hmm. and they are special in ways that other places are not. Mm -hmm. I think this is undeniably true. So mm -hmm. it's just the question of in which way are you distinct, in which way are you special. Um, what do you see as special about different cities, like that you admire from afar, even if you've not been, been there? Like, yeah. what are you like? Oh, I like what they're doing and, there. Yeah, what this, are the things you admire about different cities in America? Well, Washington D.C. is wonderfully mercenary. Mm. I think. And there, I mean, you can find this other places too, of course. We have Wall Street, we have finance in New York. But um, the idea that you will do what needs to be done and let the blood that must be let, mm. if that is necessary, you know, if that is necessary for the goal and that's what needs to be done, um, <laughs> there's a lot of that that can float around the air in Washington, D.C. And I appreciate that attitude. Um, it... I appreciate that. that. So that's what I would say about Washington, D.C. Um, it is also a collection of very ambitious people. Sometimes, uh, well, you could say this about every place differently, but yeah, it's a, it's a collection of, it's another collection of very ambitious people, much more focused on federal government, federal law, um, but also, so that's DC is much more than this though, too. I mean, I'm characterizing the one, one face of DC that is the federal government. There is another face of DC, which is like, who's the mayor? What's the quality of life, uh, away from the Capitol complex? Wildly different. Um, so, you know, they have much more of a problem with, for example, homicide than New York does. So, but that's not what makes it special. What makes it special is this particular hard charging attitude that many people bring to our federal capital. And I do think there's a lot that is special there. Um, Nashville, country music. Mm. Again, like there's a, that's, that's where Taylor Swift came out. You know, the, uh, when I think about Tennessee as a state, very special. Mm. Uh, Dolly Parton, it's Dolly Parton's state. And all that she represents that is good and beautiful in our culture, a lot comes out of Tennessee and, and Nashville. And that's very special, a very special part of America. That's what makes it special. Um, Reba McIntyre, born in Oklahoma, if I remember correctly, um, made her way in the country music industry, largely in the middle of the country, but is now popular all over. That's very special. The country music industry has headquartered in Nashville. Very special, I think. Hmm. For example. Hmm. Thank you for answering, friend. Uh, let's return to our home destination of New York. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read a tweet that you wrote in 2022, almost two years ago now. Much has transpired for you since then. Much has uh, transpired. Um, there is a kind of person who wants to help make a new golden age. My whole thing is that getting those people into New York City's civic structure is a vital component of any golden age. But most of them 
wouldn't touch government, especially city government, with a 10-foot pole. Why is getting <clears throat> those people into New York City's civic structure a vital component of any golden age? Well, so the first question is, you know, who are these kinds of people? What is the golden age? And why are they important for instrumentalizing or bringing about the golden age? So when I say the kind of person who wants a golden age, you know, you might think of Visa. Mm -hmm. I think he's uh, a lot of people might he might pop up into a lot of people's heads um, if they're in a certain social graph. But also uh, America has a long and robust tradition of people having big dreams for the future of the country, mm -hmm. for their state, for their city. Um, and a, a golden age is, for a lot of them, I would broadly characterize it as things are being created, things are being built, there is forward momentum, things are getting better, uh, largely characterized by act, you know, acts of embodied, created things, acts of creativity, acts of production. Um, and, okay, so that if that's what a golden age is, why are these people important to the golden age? The people who want it, they say they want it. They say they want the big thing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people who are just all talk. Uh, but there's a lot of people here who they earnestly want this for humanity. And they will do work. They will try to do it. Um, the problem is the anti-politics meme, among other things, keeps them out of government and politics. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I say... Getting, getting these people into government and politics is vital for a golden age. What I'm saying is there's a group of people who will actually do work to try to bring about a better civilization. They really will throw their whole selves into it. But you can't activate that energy from them until and unless... Uh, you can't activate it on behalf of the government, the law, civics. Um, which means, you know... Government law and civics underpin any golden age, um, I would argue, certainly in the modern era. If you have bad law, if you have a bad government, probably you are not going to have a golden age. You might have a good time for a second, but I don't think it will last. Um, so if you don't bring these people into the government, you're depriving it of an immense amount of energy that would do work on its behalf in an earnest, charitable, more optimistic way. Um if you don't do that, the people who tend to be left in government are ones who think these grand visions are not possible, they're not realistic. Let's just stick with iterating in small ways on what we have. You're left with people who are kind of like caretakers of what someone else created. So what I mean specifically is there are people who have drive, they have energy, they have the things that government and civics need to truly blossom. And because I think government and civics are instrumental to any golden age, um, that means I think that these people need to be in it so that government and law can also blossom. That's how I draw these things together. Part of what I'm hearing is that you... There's actually two claims in this tweet, or there's probably multiple, but like two pivotal ones for this conversation. Um, one is those people should care more about civics than they do. And then the other claim is those people should care more about New York in particular and its civics than they do. Is that true or uh, anything you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I also sometimes use the word should. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there's an implied like, you should do this if your goals are X, Y, and Z. My goal, Tashin, is yes. to bring out something that is isomorphic to a golden age. I would describe it yeah. very differently, but yeah. you can view me as such a person. I have no plans currently to run for office. I'm not interested in civics, although I am interested mm -hmm. in social rulemaking, especially in social groups and workplaces. Um, I'm not... I don't like New York City, uh, especially Manhattan, just um, f subjectively. I mean, like it's phenomenologically mm -hmm. very overwhelming for my nervous system. So it's not pleasant for me to be there. Uh, and I'm about to be in New York for three months. I'll be in New York at Fractal University. Uh, so um, I, I would really invite you to speak to me in particular and almost um, uh, persuade me of whatever seems good to persuade me of, knowing that um, I'm subject to a particular variant of the anti-politics meme in your sense-making. Yeah. 
Um, so broadly speaking about government law, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, the companies that you're allowed to start, and uh, not just the kind of not just the kind of company in terms of industry, but literally the legal shape of it. Is it an LLC? Mm-hmm. Is it an S corp? That all comes from government and legal innovation. Um, whether or not we can move forward is fundamentally rooted in what our laws are, how they're made, how they're enforced. So, for example, uh, often people will say innovation, it's bits versus atoms. Mm. I I do not say this. I say it's bits versus atoms versus law. Mm. And any one of them can move first, but it is often the law that moves first and incentivizes the movement of atoms and bits. For example, um, a lot of the modern economy, a lot of modern innovation is built on the LLC, the limited liability company. It's a specific, um, relatively low maintenance highly flexible way of incorporating the thing that you're doing. And it is a potent version of legal innovation. It was legalized first at the state level. I mean, it only exists at the state level um, in Wyoming in 1977. And by 1996, it was everywhere, including all 50 states in DC. People sort of think the LLC has been with us forever, and it has not. It is a, it is a very new phenomenon that someone came up with. And it changed the way that we do business. And someone could come up with that again. But in any case, imagine they didn't. We would have lost a lot of flexibility. We would we would have actually we would have lost quite a lot. Um, so that's an example of something I point to that people might not appreciate how a lot of the innovation, a lot of the creativity that they see all throughout America is due to the fact that someone changed a law. And it's not just, uh, you know, changing the way, changing corporate law or changing the way that you can incorporate something, the way that you do art, the way that you paint, the way that you choose to live with other people, the clothes that you buy, all of these things change and are shifted depending on what laws are on the books and how they're enforced. And I think people are often not aware of the legal web that they live within and why such seeming far-flung things as like visual art or paint or something are shaped by the law or not shaped by the law. I mean, to, for example, to, I think most Americans maybe don't appreciate this. It's also a deliberate decision on the part of lawmakers to choose not to legislate in an area. Many places choose to legislate everything. Uh, They have a paradigm that says everything is illegal unless we say it's legal. Broadly speaking, America was founded on and operates on the opposite paradigm. Everything is legal unless we specifically say it's not. Um, There are some areas where this has flipped within America. Land use law is one of them. Zoning is one of them. Everything is illegal unless we specifically say. But uh, who makes the law? What they make the law about? Or whether they choose, maybe they don't make the law. Maybe they say, no, actually, we're not. We are not going to do this. We're leaving it up to people within a certain frame. That's why I think it's important. Um, I mean, for example, I wasn't legally allowed to get married until 2015 throughout the whole nation. Uh, That's an important law. And people fought to change that law. But again, I would say it's not just these big architectonic fights or changes people think about. What the law is and what it allows, how it's shaped, permeates even the small little decisions that people make in their life. And so... I see the law as a tool for allowing people to live the, the way they want to live in so many different ways. And so the question the question then is, well, if you can't afford to live in New York City, let's say you really want to, or maybe you can't afford to live in the Bay Area. Fundamentally, the solution there is more housing supply, and fundamentally, that requires changing laws. No way around it. Hmm. Let me digest that for a moment and just sit with that and then ask a new question. Hmm? Hmm. So far in this conversation, you've persuaded me of a few things. Uh, One is 
Um, politics is social rulemaking. You have to orient towards that uh, at different scales. Not useful to ignore it. It's better to steer towards good social rulemaking. Um, you've persuaded me that uh, New York is a beautiful, important city uh, in a certain way. Like I, I already knew that, but um, like you have given me a new eyes with which to see it that uh, have sort of increased my desire to go there and to make build a relationship with that city. Um, worth noting that, well, yeah, I'll set that aside. Um, you've also persuaded me that laws are an important lever for change, uh, in addition to what you call bits and atoms. I guess the question is, I, I think the levers that I've mostly used have been not bits or atoms, but you could say culture and consciousness, like my own state of mind, my own awareness, my own perception, and then manifesting that through culture shifts, like writing essays or making art. I'm also building an organization called the Service Guild, mm -hmm. um, which is not currently a nonprofit. It might be one day. It uh, is not ever going to be a corporation, I think. I think. I don't know. I'd be open to changing that if it seemed like it made... I don't know enough about S Corps or B Corps to know if that would be a good fit. There's other entities that might be interesting. It feels like it wants to be an entity that doesn't current isn't currently available and like an informal between friends sounds... org. What's oh, that? I was going to say if it if it's one that doesn't exist, sounds like someone needs Should to make... uh, draft a corporate statute. Maybe. I could be persuaded of that. That's an interesting indicator. I don't know enough yet, like what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's too nascent to like formalize, I think, but I'd be open to that as it becomes clear. Um, so I guess the question is, with all that preamble, knowing that you're talking to this being in particular, uh, mm -hmm. um, how would you relate, for lack of a better word, the different levers of bits, atoms, laws, the ones you mentioned, and the ones I'm adding, culture and consciousness like how do you sense make about the relationship between those and and this this is a two part question i guess how do you make sense of the relationship between those and i can remind you of the second one if it's useful but i'm just showing you where i'm going how do you like weight them in relation to each other for for me like what would you persuade me of like to hold them in relationship well as far as interrelationships go i think most things are downstream of culture so culture being the collection of artifacts art and ideas that a certain social graph a certain people has one one should not ignore you should not ignore i should not ignore both of us should not ignore any of them how do they interrelate? There are such strong interrelations between them. You could, I think, say everything is downstream of culture. I think you could say everything is downstream of consciousness. Consciousness, yes. culture. Yes. You could you could arrange them this way. Yeah. Um, but the feedback loops are so, there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. Um what the politics of an area are influence the consciousness of that area are the technology the i mean these things all influence each other mm -hmm. um so in general although i do think you could you could make a model of them that says this one is preeminent and then these ones are downstream of it in practice it's much more the interrelationship is much more a uh watching the feedback loops and the balance between all of them in practice um, because they are so tightly interwoven. So that's how I think about the interrelationship between them. And then uh, the second question was... What would you persuade me of, given the interrelationships of these things? 
based on what you know about to me. Put, to put more weight on politics. Hmm. And when I say politics, I mean put more weight on governmental politics. But the caveat there is, I think there is a way to do that that does not feel bad. Mm -hmm. I think there's a way to do it that feels good, that feels like you're doing pleasant exertion in the world, that feels like you're expanding uh, what you experience of the world in a good way, that you're bringing good things into your orbit. So, I mean, something I often tell my students is, you know, people have such a bad time when they engage in politics, partially because honestly, they don't do it well. They don't know what they're mm -hmm. doing. They're not doing it consciously. They're just scrolling on their phones, looking at what's happening, some play by play in a federal election. And I just think, oh, heavens, the world of government is so much larger uh, and deeper and more frustratingly beautiful than that. <laughs> um, so I, what I tell them is, look, stop trying to have a bad time. Mm -hmm. Stop deliberately having a bad time because that's what you're doing. I'm not here to have a bad time. I'm here to have a good time. And I am trying to have a good time and I'm having a good time. Mm -hmm. So when I tell people, pay attention to government, pay attention to politics, that is also really firmly surrounded by additional context mm -hmm. to help to help them do that in a way that is not bad. Because I mm -hmm. think by default, most people are going to shoot their foot off. Yes. Uh without without further without further ideas or instruction around that. And, and I would also tell people, like, if you get into this and you're, you're just feeling bad, it's making you feel bad. You need to pull back. Um, mm -hmm. don't try to force yourself through that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm happy to help people, you know, maybe they need to pull back. Let's talk about it. Let's, there's a different way of approaching this. I, I referenced early, I, early in the conversation, I said that I feel like we had independently arrived at a lot of the same values or motivational structures or something like that. And then yeah, we're choosing two pretty different things with our lives right now. Um, and this is one of them. I try to steer by fun. Um, and if it's not fun, I don't want to do it. And that's probably why I've over-indexed on not pursuing politics because it hasn't seemed fun. At this point, I'm like, yeah, it could be fun. I, I could take that. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not also just like, oh, it's all bad. Um, I think it would be good if I knew more about the laws around organizations and which organization might fit the one that I'm which law, if any, might best govern the organization I'm trying to create that I that I can update for? Um, yeah. What's that? Oh, I was just I'm looking. I have a I have a book on corporate law right there. But I it's, see. It's there's like five books on top of it. I'm not going to pull that right now. <laughs> yes. Another one that I come up against frequently is like hmm, how to put it. So I'm a pilgrim. I go from place to place. Um. I am currently legally a resident of Massachusetts at my father's house. Massachusetts. Uh, yes. Uh, but I am, I don't know, I'm there for different amounts of time each year, but like, I think of myself as a resident of the place that I currently am. <laughs> That's my home. Like this is my home right now for another week or so. And then my home will be a different place. And a lot of governmental structures, to my view, falsely assume that you are based in one location that you own a home. Um, they don't serve the homeless population very well. Um, I am voluntarily basically homeless um, or wandering from place to place. It would be great to have the government recognize that, that I don't have a default location. I'm not interested in one. I am yeah. interested in participating in civics. Despite that, I'm a valuable citizen. But uh, that's something that affects me a lot. I don't like healthcare, taxes, Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. That said, recognizing that those things are having influence on my life, it doesn't currently seem like worth focusing on other than being aware of it more from this conversation, like learning more about it maybe, but it doesn't seem worth putting effort into like trying to change those laws right now. Um, I'm, if, I'd be open to being persuaded yeah. otherwise, but I'm curious what you think. Well, I, I don't know if I have a thing to persuade here, which is to say, so you hit on it. We're doing different things with our lives. Mm -hmm. um, no one can do everything. Mm -hmm. And for me to bring about the best world, you need to work with other people. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, you know, don't save the world, just take the first step and then find the others who are doing that. You work, you work together. Mm -hmm. So I lean very heavily into government, mm -hmm. very heavily. That means I lean more lightly into other things necessarily. Mm -hmm. Same for you. We all, you know, 
we all have limited time. So no one has to do what I'm doing with government. Some people even do more. Um, mm -hmm. So what I do ask all of, so when people finish my classes, um, particularly my foundations of New York City class, um, I say like, you don't have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything after you leave this class, except I do ask that you uphold the rules of etiquette that were enforced in this class. And I ask that you try to bring those alive in your social sphere, in your life as you're living, which is to say, do politics, hmm. um, do social rulemaking, because etiquette is a social technology. It's a set of rules. And so that's it's relatively lightweight. And I think it's 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 not like you have to go out and run for office. You don't have to draft laws. You don't have to, you know, changing some of these laws that you're talking about, big lift. And like, yeah, you know, people only have so many hours. You pick mm -hmm. what you can do. And I do think most people can do a productive amount of politics, even if they don't have that much time to dedicate to it. So the rules of etiquette I have are politics is a good word. Mm -hmm. So outcompete the anti-politics meme. The second one is be concrete or recognize the level of concreteness that is that people are using when they talk about government and the law. So for example, most people will say sentences like the government should do X. Hmm. Not a very useful sentence. I mean, you're expressing a proposition and an opinion, but operationally, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Which part of the government, which part, which level, which book of law, which person? According I feel to like a law? better translation of that often would be like, this is currently not meeting my needs of this and that. Yes. Yeah. So it is useful as a statement of my needs aren't being met. It is, mm -hmm. it's, it's saying that useful, but as in terms of, but a lot of people do want it to say more than that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are using that phrase as a legitimate expression of what should change operationally in politics. And often those statements are just not helpful. Um, just because they're not concrete enough. And so concrete would be like specific policies or something yeah, like, like that. I want I want this section of the city charter changed from this to this. And it's mm. going to be changed by this mechanism. Or this maybe at I a larger scale, good. like I think there sure. should be more housing and we're going to accomplish that by incentivizing this or something. Yeah. And you could say that about many levels. Like we're going mm -hmm. to change that at the New York state level by lifting the floor area ratio cap of 12 in the multiple dwellings act. That applies to New York City. Very good. We're just going to erase that part of the law. So um, yeah, like that kind of thing. So speaking that concretely, which I do train, that's what the whole point of class is to get you to the place where you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, or if you don't know how to, let's say you don't know what law needs to change, you broadly know, okay, this is going to be in uh, the state level book of statute from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And you can still get pretty specific. There are a lot of very useful models you can use to still get pretty specific that are helpful. So anyway, politics is a good word. Be concrete. And concreteness tends to take the temperature down mm -hmm. too, because mm -hmm. you'll have people who say like, Gov you, you know, get the government out of healthcare. And then you have people who say universal Medicaid or something. And you're like, eh, neither you know. <laughs> These are both sort of fake propositions, the way most people say them. And if you what I find in class is once you enforce the etiquette of be concrete, most people actually on the object level, if they don't agree, if they don't come to agree, they actually just see it as a form of joint problem solving, more like pair coding. Mm. So the getting people to the concrete object level actually is very salubrious for political rhetoric. It's mm. the overly abstract grandiose statements where people, uh, not always, but that's where they tend to get very mad at each other. Um, so the and those are the two principal ones. Are there and then there others? are other, Yeah, well, I'm just trying to have a good time. Mm. Find the good time and extend grace. Mm. And by grace I mean giving that which is not earned or deserved in the present in the hope that it will be earned or deserved in the future. Damn. That's good. Um and grace has a central feature in my life, not just in my politics or in my class. Um, it's the way that we live together very mm. well. And the example I always use is I, in New, in New York City, it's not, you know, it's, it's everywhere, but in New York City, there are people that I know who I consider to be excellent people, wonderful citizens, and they do not think that gay marriage should be legal. Mm. Um, 
I look forward to the coffees and conversations I have with these people. Mm. I mm. like them. I like them. Um, okay, well, how the you know how the heck does this come about? What is the confluence of factors, psychological and otherwise, that permits this to happen? Grace. Fundamentally, I obviously want them to change their mind. They want me to change my mind. But, uh, it, and I, so for example, I don't think they deserve a certain amount of my esteem, deserve, according to some, a certain amount of my esteem because they, they, they really think a wrong thing about the law. They think a wrong thing about virtue, about me. I think these things are true. However, they, as a person, are much larger than that. Um, they are in many ways wonderful and good and they see me for who I am also still want to keep interacting with me. They mm -hmm. also extend me grace. They also want me to be a part of society. They want the best for me. They want to help me. They do help me. Um, grace, ex mutually extended grace is what heals and allows people to bridge faults. And it doesn't mean that you don't recognize where you disagree but it does allow you to not just live together in this bare knuckled kind of I'm tolerating you, although it allows that too. It allows genuine deep connection between people. It allows you to get past your initial flinch and find the deep ways that you can connect, work together, live together, enjoy one another. So extend grace is the last rule of etiquette in class. But so I ask people to go forth for rules of etiquette Politics is a good word. Be concrete. Have a good time. Find the good time. Extend grace. Mm. Mm. That's a good suite of social rules under the heading etiquette. I love them. They're nourishing for me to hear. I'm glad you've said them and shared them with me. In this way, uh, How to put it, I have a lot of curiosities about your project and how it's worked and how it came about and what it involves and sort of the tactical operations of it and that sort of thing. But like mm -hmm. what you just said probably hits 80% of what I imagine I would get out of like really asking you a lot of those questions. So thank you. Yes. Well, the rules of etiquette are foundational, truly. Um, and where we have seen politics go very well at the federal, state, city level in the past, uh, well... I'll put it like this. Politics done well. 95%, it feels like a pleasant exertion. It might be a struggle, but it's a pleasant exertion. 5%, knife fight in a phone booth. No getting around mm. it. Mm. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to look some people in the eye and you're going to say, I have more votes than you. I'm enforcing my social rules on you and you don't like them. Mm. No getting around that. Uh, the difference is I believe the ratio is 95% to 5%. Some people think it's more lops, it's lopsided in the other direction. But yeah, the rules of etiquette truly are foundational for the whole class because what does it profit if you understand the government law very well, but you won't extend grace? Hmm. How does that transform how your knowledge meets and interacts with the world? Not well. So I think. So for me, the rules of etiquette very much are foundational, and they're an important precursor to any kind of legal or governmental sophistication. Which is to say, I agree with your characterization. <laughs> mm. I'm trying to catch up. There's like number, you know, I talked earlier about like speed limits and stuff. There's a number of updates I'm making in this conversation that I'm just like trying to orient towards how to integrate them all at once. Um, I think um, I'd like to ask you one more question that's genuinely alive for me. I can think of a lot of questions I would really love to ask you, but I want to I wanna, uh, close the interview portion soon. Mm -hmm. um, the one last question I'd like to ask you is, uh, um, how to phrase this 
Well, I wrote it. Yes. Do you have thoughts about the prospect of world government or world governance? Honestly, not really. Um, partially because I don't, well, by a world government, when I hear that phrase, I think one state. What What do you think it would take to do politics well at a global scale? You, you focused, I understand you are focusing your time and energy personally on New York specifically. What do you mm -hmm. guess or hypothesize or intuit would be needed in time to scale the kinds of things you're doing to a global scale? Just mm, kind of guessing, I, yeah, hand yeah. wavy. And and I would have to guess in hand wavy. Yes, so that that's helpful. all I'm asking for, yeah. Yeah. Generally speaking, so to there is doing government at a global scale, which is an inst there's an institution of government. Mm -hmm. We are very far away from that happening, and I I'm generally speaking, my default assumption is that would be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, someone would have to convince me otherwise. Mm -hmm. Doing politics, which is and then there's the thing you said, which is doing yes, politics. politics at yes. a global level. Different yes. thing. That's just social rulemaking, influencing how you know that sort of thing. Um, I think the thing that you can do in the city level that could potentially redound. The thing you could do as an American and have it redound is be unapologetically proud of the things that America does right. Mm. Because I do think it is fashionable today for people to view, view America only as a collection of its greatest crimes. And they blind themselves to the truly atypical nature of what this country is for the good. And I do think it is fashionable. And I use that in a pejorative sense, fashionable. People unthinkingly taking on opinions because they want to derive a cheap form of status and esteem from others. I think they think there's a version of person who conflates taking an issue seriously with being incredibly mad about it. Mm. Um, or who intrinsically rejects the idea that you can be proud of a nation. And I disagree with all of these things. Um, in general, often what I what I wind up saying to some people is, I think I have a firmer grip on what's gone wrong in, wrong in America and in more detail than most of the people who claim to care about that. I don't reject the things that are going wrong. Um, you try to, you want to fix them, but also let's focus on what's going right. I think that is going underappreciated and to del deleterious effect on the international, international stage. Um, Americans being forcefully proud of our freedom of expression is important. What it allows us to do, we should be proud of. We should be proud that we have a political system that protects it in I think uh, freedom of speech, and there's a legal meaning here, culturally separate meaning. Legally, I think America is truly exceptional. If American exceptionalism applies as an idea literally to anywhere, it is freedom of expression uh, in ways that even places like the UK, Germany, Canada, like the, the peer nations, so to speak, they do not have freedom of speech in the way that we do. Hmm. Um, and I don't think most, most Americans know that. Hmm. Um, so being unapologetically proud of the things that are going well and refusing to conflate America with only its worst crimes. This, I think, will help the world, people in other countries, do the same in their own country because American culture is hegemonic. It filters down all over the world. And right now, we are exporting a lot of self-loathing, self a lot of self-hate, a lot of self-doubt, and we are exporting a refusal to acknowledge that which is good. So, you know, I think we should change that. Hmm. I think we must look more closely at that which is going well, and we must celebrate it more potently. Hmm. I take that invitation. Thank you. Let me ask a brief follow-up question, which is, well, you ask as you will, which is, um, it's not obvious to me from my perspective. I, I imagine, uh, maybe this won't be brief. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that you approve of state and federal government as a structure in America. 
until someone thinks of something better. But yes, I do like our federal system. Uh -huh. Very good. It's not obvious to me why someone who liked this system wouldn't approve of the same thing at a s scale higher, where there's a federal and a global government. Well, partially because a governmental structure written down legally is not independent of the people in the context it is placed upon. Mm -hmm. So what if it's Earth? What is the so what is the political machine appropriate to all of the people of Earth? Yes. All the beings on Earth, I would say. All Which the is actually two yes. that's actually meaningfully two leaps. One is to the scale yeah. of Earth and one is to the scope of all beings. Yeah. I mean, even New York State law has grappled New York City and state have grappled with this. There was a case about an elephant in the Bronx Zoo, whether or not it's a person. Mm. These cases come up. Um the court said no, but these cases come up. Um mm. so I do not think that there is a governing structure that is appropriate for all of the people, that to subsume all of the people of Earth. Um, Partially because I do think the people in important ways need to want that shape. They need to agree on it in a certain uh, fashion. And the people are not asking for it currently. Well, they're not asking for it, but also I think there is not a shape of government that you could come up with the whole earth that would not be violently opposed by most of the earth. Fascinating. Why is that not true at the federal government level? Like most Americans agree with federal government. Well, it's a, it's part of our culture at this point. Um, ah, so I mean, we need you, to you change the say, culture. <laughs> well, yeah. You'd have to change the culture of everyone. Very good. I'll work on it and we'll get back to you. And so yeah. I don't, I, just for the record, let me state on record my own opinions here. Um, just because I think this is important, uh, if only for my own posterity. Um, I am not attached to the idea of world government as such, although it appeals to me. I have no plans to run for it. God forbid. <laughs> um, world president. Yeah, please. No. Um, however, it seems to me that world governance or in your phrase, politics, social rulemaking is needed to address the complex global problems that we face and opportunities. Shall we yeah. say opportunities? Uh, that yeah. sounds more fun. And it, it seems to me the default would be something that's like scaled up state to federal, federal to global. And yeah, I imagine we need a culture shift that takes into account both the need for a global gov governance solution and one that expands of scope to all beings on this planet, not just humans. That's my current position, which I'm very open to revising, but that at this time, January of 2024 is my current perspective. And I'm also open to you persuading me otherwise by the end of this conversation, but that's my current perspective. Yeah, well, clearly we need international cooperation in so many realms mm -hmm. to achieve many of the things that we want for the whole planet. Mm -hmm. No denying that. So. The question is, can you put a superstructure, a final form of appeal and enforcement over every state hmm. right now? Um, is that what the federal government is to the states right now? Well, yes. I see. Very although good. it gets although it gets messy. So it is not like the states are powerless. They absolutely are not powerless, and mm -hmm. they they do share sovereignty. So, for mm -hmm. example, you could imagine a if you want to put one level of federation above the national level on the global stage, the question is, what is the relation, what is the level and nature of shared sovereignty hmm. between nation states and the federal government? And um, I think that is, I mean, that's a difficult problem. I haven't heard a solution. If you want to do that and you think it could work well, I have not yet heard a version I think is even close to compelling. That, um, so that that feels, um, I, I could imagine a world I, where you said like, for example, almost like this is like mathematically impossible or something like that, like like a, a proof where you're like, this is not possible. And then a different world where you're saying, I haven't seen anything desirable or good yet. Uh, and it seems like you're saying more of the latter than the former. Like th not that it's inherently impossible to have right. a global governance solution that you would approve of, but that you have not seen one yet that would satisfy your own values and needs and what you see as making sense. Right. I would say it's probably the second one, although I suspect it also might not be doable. 
but you know i i can't say that i have uh thought about it for as long as i, I mean probably like the federal government would have looked impossible to like roman tribes or something like that or you know yeah yeah i mean the federal government looked impossible to people in 1787 and there it so, is at the constitutional so convention. i think we need something similar I, I i make very little claims as to what that looks like but um i don't know to me it seems like a no-brainer that we need to wrestle with our we well, need to reckon with ourselves as a planet Yes. Um, and whether or not that's a for, I mean, I will say like the, the countervailing concern here is lack of anti-fragility, lack of robustness, mm -hmm. imposing one way of doing things from the top. Very dangerous. I, I think someone else such as yourself would be very well positioned to articulate all of the concerns that that would go into. And I'm very yeah. sympathetic to those but concerns. In any case. Yes. Uh, Just for the record, yes. I am, I, I am not, um, I mean, maybe I actually was recently called an authoritarian, so maybe I have authoritarian tendencies, but uh, I don't see myself as like really in the scope of this conversation, um, proposing a particular solution or like that, oh, yeah. we should have um, yeah. a world I president, mean, in, for example, or something like that. In, in many ways, I would say it's something like uh, figure out how for most for most people, when they think about this, I would say something like figure out how to govern a state and a nation well, and then and do that, you know, stably. And uh, then we can talk about world government. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think most people cannot even figure out how to run the United States well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still learning how to govern an organization of, say, eight people. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, in any case, I, I think it's plain. I'm highly skeptical for many reasons of the idea of world government. But uh, yes, the the laws of physics do not preclude a universe where it could work out. Definitely. Yes. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe there's something about entropy working in a complex system that actually would preclude it, but I can't say that I've given that proper thought. Huh. Fascinating. Well, this conversation has been so lovely. I've learned so much. I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to say about any of the things we've talked about or something nearby or something you'd like to just talk more about, uh, Open it to you, my friend. All right. Well, I have one, just one slug line, and then I have some. I have a, a at least one question for you, which is: so I don't think I ever said what maximum New York is fully. Yes, I, I uh, had like twenty questions about that that I've elided. So feel free to uh, say. Maximum New York is a civics school that I founded based in New York City, and the fundamental premise, the animating theory behind it, is no one knows how. The, very few people know how the government works. No one really has a way to learn it. Even things like political science degrees do not teach people. If anything, they misinform them. So my thought is, well, I will create a school that does teach people how all this works. And it's not armchair philosophy. It is theory integrated with practice with dedicated feedback loops. You're doing the thing. And that many good things will come of this as, a, as it scales, as it continues to turn out people. That's the theory behind it. And the classes I teach, this semester I'm teaching five there's Foundations of New York City, which is an accelerated introduction into New York City government law, Foundations of New York State, and Foundations of America. So those those foundations classes are designed to look at every level. Oh, are, are those and, are there multiple of some of them and it's only three kinds of classes? You said five earlier. Yes. So there's those three, and yeah. then there's two more seminars. Uh what the are the shorter, seminars? The shorter, more specialized seminars. One is called the Founding 40. Hmm. which is 1763 to 1803. And it looks at the American founding era. What mm -hmm. happened and how did it set up the trajectory that we're still following today? Mm -hmm. uh, what really happened? Because uh, most most people have, uh, it's like I said, it's far stranger, far more interesting than I think most people would expect. Um, and then the last one is called How to Write a Law. It's a class on legislative drafting. How do you actually write a law? What's actually happening there? And once you have that basic skill set, you will never look at any of these things, but especially law writing, once mm -hmm. you have to do it, you will never look at the government the same way again. Mm. It will It's a paradigm flip. Um, so those are the five classes I'm teaching. And then in the latter half of my semester, April, May, I'll be teaching classes on corporations, for example, how to build one called how to build a skyscraper. Um, so I teach a variety of classes, mostly based in New York City. I am helping people in other cities to stand up their own version of this, their own civic schools, because I think the theory, the theory of more people need to know. Which cities currently? Um, well, right now, San Francisco, there's people interested and in people that I'm working with in San Francisco. San Francisco is the furthest ahead. Um, Austin. And then 
had conversations with a ton of people all over the Very country good. about it. But at the moment, it's the limiting factor is what is there an individual who wants to really take this on as their th their big life? Project? So that person could reach out to you if they're in a different city, if they were like willing to commit time and energy to making it available yeah. in their city. Yeah. Or even if they w just want to explore, hmm. what would this require of me? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so that's Maximum New York. And I, like I said, I want everyone to love their place the way I love New York. And so I think, I think the general theory is applicable in most places, although the implementation will be a little bit different. Um, so that's Maximum New York. And then as far as my question for you goes, how do you, first, how do you select the individuals that you'd like to be on your podcast? I'm aware of all of the people in my social graph. I feel my body and how I feel about what they're doing. And if there's resonance, there's something I'm curious about that I feel I could learn from. I think of this as my school, like you and I are in a virtual Zoom room that is my school right now. And you have been my teacher for nearly three hours now. Um, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> And then I guess I roughly prioritize by like, on the one hand, somatic resonance. And on the other hand, like, I kind of value something like this person has a legible service project that learning more about would benefit not only me, but the world, something like that, which uh, sometimes I have very illegible people on there. And I sort of, it seems good to learn. Maybe it's just somatic resonance, but like, yeah, I mean, you have a very clear, legible social project, service project that's of benefit. <clears throat> and uh, I wanted to learn more about it. And it also, it's like incredibly resonant for me in my body when I see your tweets or what you've written about it, despite the fact that I have a, had a variant of the anti-politics meme. Um, had, past tense. <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, I mean, we'll see, but... Um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, so it's just like, and then I have very because I wander from place to place, it's sometimes difficult to schedule as much as I'd like. I could have, there's worlds where I could do one of these a day probably, but I'm not there yet. And uh, mm -hmm. for now it's like, I don't know, one a month is probably about baseline. And uh, I've been looking forward to this one. Mm -hmm. And so will you be, when you, you are a pilgrim, mm -hmm. will you be always a pilgrim? Is it inherent in your concept of being a pilgrim that that is redundant to say, I will be a pilgrim for X amount of time? Or mm -hmm. is it inherent in the concept that it is perpetual? Mm. What is it that you're curious about my pilgrimage so I can answer accordingly? Well, there are different kinds of pilgrims. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, when I think of the word, I think of uh, you can make you can make a pilgrimage to a definite place like mm -hmm. Mecca or mm -hmm. something. Um so it's it's bounded in a way. And but from what I know about you, and also there's many different ways to be a pilgrim. Sometimes you're a pilgrim to, you know, the kingdom of God or no place you can get on earth. And mm. so for the duration of your time here, it is it's perpetual. Mm. And there's there's many different kinds of ways to be a pilgrim and to have a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And really that's all there was to it. I see. Um, mm -hmm. That's all I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Good. That's helpful. Um, one of my heroes is this woman named Peace Pilgrim. Uh, have you heard of her? I haven't. Um, she lived in the last century. Uh, she was, historically speaking, the first woman to walk the Appalachian Trail in its entirety in a year. Um, spiritually, she was an independent mystic uh, who came to direct realization of God through her own life and she taught through her example and she specifically walked across the continent something like seven or eight times for the last several decades of her life um spreading teachings that have like no other spiritual teaching filled me with clarity and purpose and wisdom and joy uh, which is an incredible compliment coming from me because most of my spiritual home is Buddhism. Uh, and so I'm basically saying that she's been more useful to me as a teacher than the Buddha, which I think is partly because she's of my time, much closer to my time than the Buddha. And the Buddha was speaking to a very different culture 
a very different place, a very time. I, I find the Buddhist teachings of each each uh, era that I have been exposed to incredibly beneficial, and yet Peace Pilgrim has become one of my main teachers. Even though I never met her, I've only read her writings. Um, I try to live my life in accordance with what I've learned from her. And she said that a pilgrim is a wanderer with a purpose, and her purpose was peace. And she said that peace starts with inner peace, that you have to have inner peace before there can be world peace. But she was very concerned with politics, actually. And she did not have the anti-politics meme. She made very interesting political proposals, which I think you would find concrete and graceful, uh, uh, which are fascinating. They're underrated amongst those who appreciate Peace Pilgrim, as I do. Um, I have thoughts about that I won't <laughs> tell you about but at this time. But it's interesting that she had very specific political proposals. Um, which made good sense. I, I would mm -hmm. update them in different ways, but it, it, it's also interesting that she thought about it because in a, in a lot of ways, she was a very simple woman. She wasn't um, an intellectual. I don't know what her class background was, but I don't have the sense she was wealthy or like had a particularly unusual education or something like that. And she independently came up with like very sound proposals um, despite her nature and background, I would say. That's how I would characterize her from afar. Anyway, as for my pilgrimage, my pilgrimage is very different than Peace's pilgrimage. I've done walking pilgrimages twice in my life. Those were in a lot of ways more formative for me than any meditation retreat I've done. And I've done many and long retreats. Um, probably, I forget the count, but over 50 retreats, the longest one was probably in total. And I spent basically the first half of 2020 in a number of different retreats during the pandemic, actually. And um Yet walking pilgrimages were probably on along a certain axis more significant to me than any meditation retreat I've done. Um, my pilgrimage is one that I have sort of improvised. Uh, that Peace Pilgrim was not trying to persuade people to do pilgrimage. She was very clear that if you listen to her teachings, you may very well not be on a pilgrimage. I have felt called to be a pilgrim of my own kind. Um, where I have not been interested in the traditional career paths or life paths that have been offered to me. Monasticism was the most compelling one, and I eventually decided to leave monastic training. Um, and I view it uh, as a spiritual practice, as a service project, an ongoing service project. And it's one whose nature I'm still learning about. I suspect the way I talk about this in time will be different than the way I can speak about it now. But it's an indefinite pilgrimage. I tra travel by plane for a lot. I also use money. Um, she had, she basically didn't use money to, with an asterisk. She would, she would basically send people mail. That's what she would use money for. That's it. Um, but, um, so the nature of my pilgrimage is very different than hers. It's more suited to my nature and my time and my circumstances. Um, it's indefinite. I, I could see worlds where I stopped my pilgrimage, basically two worlds right now. One would be where my service organization that I'm building was bottlenecked on the fact that I was on pilgrimage and it would be better if I was able to like book podcasts every day, for example, or something like that, or meetings. Um, the other one would be if I found a life partner that I wanted to commit it to, and we decided that it was uh, prudent to live in one place. Uh, I could also imagine meeting someone who wanted to be on pilgrimage with me. That would be lovely. Um, although higher challenge level, because people might not necessarily want to host two people. Uh, my life and work is made possible by people who put me up. Uh, I'm staying with a friend right now. I always stay with friends. Um, I make new friends by staying with them. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does. And so the pilgrimage continues. The pilgrimage continues, and it brings me to your neighborhood for an extended period of time, which I hope and expect will change both my life, our social graphs, and eventually the world. That's the way, step by step. Step by step, yes. Uh, Good. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Daniel. This has been delightful, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Very much so. Thank you for having me.